time is now 9.55 a.m.
the Honorable, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. We will hear argument first this morning, Case 18-9526, McGirt v. Oklahoma. Mr. Gershengorn? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, this case is resolved by the fundamental proposition that decisions about sovereign rights are for Congress to make, and Congress makes those decisions by speaking clearly in the text. The decision below must be reversed because the text makes clear that Congress never terminated the Creek Reservation and never transferred federal criminal jurisdiction to Oklahoma. I have four basic points to make this morning. First, the Creek Nation had a reservation. The relevant treaties reserved the lands from sale and solemnly guaranteed the lands for the Creek to govern. The text of both treaties and statutes expressly identified the Creek land as a reservation. Nothing more was needed. Second, Congress did not establish, disestablish that reservation. Indeed, Congress considered hallmark language of disestablishment and rejected it. Congress initially sought session, yet instead provided only for allotment. Then, when congressional inaction would have dissolved the tribe, Congress instead preserved the tribe and its government for all purposes authorized by law. And it did so against the backdrop of existing tribal authority to legislate over reservation land. Those congressional judgments should be respected. Third, Congress did not transfer criminal jurisdiction to Oklahoma. At statehood, the Major Crimes Act established exclusive federal jurisdiction over enumerated crimes in, quote, any state of the United States. When Congress overrides the Major Crimes Act and transfers jurisdiction to a state, it does so expressly, and it did not do so here. Finally, Oklahoma's rhetoric about disruption does not change the result. On the criminal side, this court's decision in Ramos is a complete answer. And on the civil side, the main issues are tax and other regulatory issues that are routinely resolved by tribal state agreements. In any event, Parker makes clear that questions of sovereignty are distinct from claims of reservation status. This court should resolve the reservation question, leaving jurisdictional disputes to Congress, the relevant sovereign, and then for this court to resolve if and when they arise. Counsel, so let me start the uh, state argues that the territory should be analyzed as a dependent Indian community under 1151 and not as a reservation. They base this argument on our decisions in Sandoval and Creek Nation and 1151 itself, uh, and the fact that the Creeks have always maintained, they've been adamant about the fact that they are not reservation Indians. Now, you refer, of course, to the many times in which the treaty is referred to as a reservation, but what is your answer to the state's analysis of our precedent? So, Your Honor, I think both the precedent and the language support the idea that this is not a dependent Indian community. What this court said in Venetai and what Judge, then Judge Gorsuch said in Hydro Resources is that the dependent Indian community, Indian community um, label is a catch-all for tribes that did not have a reservation and are not on restricted lands. The best evidence of what Congress thought about whether Creek lands were a reservation under the statute is that Congress referred to those lands as a reservation under the statute. With respect to Sandoval and the other cases, it is crystal clear that when Sandoval and those cases are using the term dependent Indian community, and that they are describing tribes and other groups that are within Congress's broad power to legislate for, for tribes broadly. They are not excluding the, um, the creek. Indeed, and thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, counsel. Um, in uh, Solemn and in uh, Parker, uh, those cases only involved uh, the um, disposition of surplus land. And here, of course, there's much, much more being done in an uh, a whole series of statutes uh, involving both sovereignty and the allotment of land. Can you appoint to any case in which we've applied the solemn fact framework to a case that does as uh, much as this as being as is being done in this case? 
So, Your Honor, I think the key point on the the, the key point on the Parker Solemn analysis is, as your as Your Honor pointed out in that opinion, that those are not um, that that analysis doesn't derive from anything special about. Um, uh, about how much work Congress is doing. The reason the court has always required plain text is because treaty rights are at issue and plain text is required to abrogate treaty rights and because um, sovereign rights are at issue and plain text is required to abrogate sovereign rights. So there's nothing magic about Parker and Solemn in terms of whether they're dealing with surplus lands or not. The key point in Parker and Solemn is that plain text is required to do the kinds of transfers that are at issue here. And when you look at the plain text, I think this, is a, this case is even stronger than Your Honor's opinion in Parker for three main reasons. First, of course, is that the tribe was not absent from the land in the same way that the tribe was in Parker. Second, the land here was allotted in almost entirely to the tribe, to tribal members themselves, to Indians. And third, Congress took um, steps in 1906 to preserve the tribe. And I guess the thing I would point to, Your Honor, when you ask about whether there are cases like this, I think this is stronger than case, other cases because the question isn't just what did Congress fail to do. Well, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to get this point in that in, in Parker we were only dealing with one allotment statute that was disposing of surplus land. Here we're dealing with a series of statutes that go both to land, the allotment of land, and to the uh, reduction in the authority of the tribe. That's what I mean. So I understand that, Your Honor, and I think the critical point is that Congress actually preserved the tribe when it had the chance, when inaction would have dissolved the tribe. And so actually I think that makes this stronger than in other cases because Congress took Thank deliberate you. action. Thank you, Counsel. Thank dissolved. you, Justice, Justice Ginsburg. Counsel, you don't claim immunity prosecution for a major crime. I think your position is that the federal prosecutor could have charged your client. That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Federal penalties, as I understand it, are at least as harsh as the state. And in both forms, state and federal, you would have due process protections. So how are you calmed by the fact that you were tried in the state court rather than the federal court when you were exposed to the same, at least the same penalties in both? So, Your Honor, I think the harm flows any time um, that a, a, defendant, a criminal defendant is tried by a sovereign that lacks jurisdiction. I don't think that we have ever, that this court has ever said that there's a kind of harmless error analysis when a, when a sovereign asserts jurisdiction, particularly criminal jurisdiction, over a defendant, um, and that you would look to see, well, are the penalties the same? Of course, it is a different set of, I mean, it's a different juror pool, it's a different, uh, it, it is a different set of potential penalties, and so I guess I don't think that the fact that, um, that there would be a rigorous trial in federal court suggests that you would overlook the absence of jurisdiction. Indeed, it seems to me to make this case even easier in some ways because we are not claiming an immunity, as Your Honor pointed out, and indeed there would be a retrial in federal court if the court were to, uh, to, uh, to, to reverse. Uh, what makes this case hard is that there have been hundreds, hundreds of prosecutions, some very heinous offenses, under state law on your view, it would all become undone. And if you can compare that to the situation in our recent Ramos case where there would be, there's a question about you doing already tried cases. Here, the Ramos retroactivity uh, pales in comparison to what is involved here, hundreds of prosecutions, murder for terrible sexual offenses, they, these would all have to be done years later when the witnesses may not be there anymore. It's hundreds of cases. So, Your Honor, there are hundreds of cases. There may be hundreds of cases. Actually, it, in truth, we don't know how many cases this state 
which has the numbers, hasn't uh, suggested that there are anything, been able to document there are anything like hundreds of cases, but they are fewer than in Ramos. And in any event, what this court said in Ramos was that that provides no reason to disregard the plain text to be sure that there will be people. Thank you, counsel. Justice Breyer. Uh, good morning, counsel. Uh, minor point, but uh, one, of the, one of the arguments, I think, is that whether they're a reservation or not, Congress wanted state courts to try the major state crimes. And in reference to that, uh, I think the government cites Felix Cohen, who was a great expert in this area. When I looked at his letter, he does seem to say that. So if you have any comments uh, about that, about his argument or about uh, that particular uh, aspect of it, I'd like to hear them. So, Your Honor, I think that the, the, the law is clear that Congress did not intend for, crimes to, for tribal crimes to be tried, and I think this is one of the most straightforward statutory construction cases this court will see. The Major Crimes Act at statehood provided that it applied to any state of the United States. There is no exception for Oklahoma, and there was none before, at, or after statehood. Second, what they have pointed to, what the other side has pointed to, is what happened before statehood. And what happened before statehood was that the crimes were being prosecuted in the name of the United States, in courts set up by Congress, applying federal law, which, the, which had adopted Arkansas law as the rule of decision. It is the exact opposite of conferring jurisdiction on the states to try. Third, there was nothing in the Enabling Act that would have changed that. Indeed, the Enabling Act sent to federal courts all cases which, had they been committed in a state, would have been subject to federal prosecution. That describes the Major Crimes Act perfectly. And finally, Your Honor, when Congress transfers jurisdiction to a state, it does so expressly. In the Gauntlet, which this court described as the first major transfer of jurisdiction, the language used was jurisdiction is conferred. In Public Law 280, the states shall have jurisdiction. In New York, New York shall have jurisdiction. And even in, with respect to Oklahoma, in 1908, when they transferred when Congress transferred probate jurisdiction, it said the, that um, the Oklahoma courts shall have jurisdiction. And so Thank you, Congress- Counsel. Justice Alito? <clears throat> uh, you referred to the Oklahoma Enabling Act, but the language in that is that um, a case would be, tra a case that was pending in the territorial court at the time of statehood would be sent to one of the new federal district courts or to one of the new state courts, depending on where it would have been prosecuted if it had been prosecuted in a state. It doesn't say in a state in Indian country. It says in a state. So isn't the clear meaning of that uh, that cases in Oklahoma would be treated like cases anyplace else? Sure, but I don't. They treated like any place else, meaning it was subject to the Major Crimes Act. So I do, I agree with you that there is no Oklahoma exceptionalism, but I think that cuts exactly in our favor. What Oklahoma is saying is that uniquely among all the states in the union, it's exempt from the Major Crimes Act. I think the Enabling Act, the language Your Honor is citing, does exactly the opposite. The language says... That in the 1897 statute, which said that quote, the laws of the United States enforced in the territory shall apply to all persons therein, irrespective of race. And yet you're saying that cases at the time of statehood would be treated based on race. How can that be consistent with the 1897 Act? Because I think the 1897 Act, Your Honor, extends, if what the US 1897 Act does is extend both U.S. law and, and the uh, Arkansas law, regardless of race. But it did not el eliminate any language that was in the Major Crimes Act already. That was a portion of U.S. law. But regardless, Your Honor, of what happens pre-statehood, I mean, we can debate that, but regardless of what happened pre-statehood, there's no disagreement that the Major Crimes Act applies of its own term at statehood. Statehood itself was a major event that transferred um, that, that obviously transferred Oklahoma from a territory to a state. And if that what happened after what happened after statehood? Can you cite a single case under the Major Crimes Act that was transferred 
to work thereafter prosecuted in federal court? No, Your Honor, but this court has made clear that events on the ground don't override the text. What, what we never interpret criminal statutes to be, but the executive... Counsel, thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, um, Justice Ginsburg pointed out that some of the penalties in federal court would be higher than those imposed in state court. Um, am I... Do you disagree that some defendants who might be entitled to raise, if you were to win, some defendants who would be entitled to challenge their convictions would choose not to because the risk would be too high for them? I think that's exactly right, Your Honor. I think that there are the, that federal penalties will often be higher. I think a number of defendants will have already served large chunks of their um, of their uh, of their sentence, and in their ability to seek relief in federal court, at least, will be limited by EDPA. So I think there are reasons to doubt the extent of the state's disruption argument here. And again, remember, the numbers are all in the state's control. And so while we've been hearing, uh, you know, both in the Murphy argument and here about, um, you know, murderers and rapists getting through, in fact, there is no evidence that the state has put forward that there will be in large numbers. And the kinds of habeas petitions that one would expect to see, the kind of tsunami that, that has been predicted, just hasn't materialized. So I, I agree with Your Honor's question there. Number two, there's so much discussion about the dependent Indian community. Um, am I to take it that your argument is that that's almost irrelevant? It is almost uh, irrelevant. It is both wrong and irrelevant. But I'll hit the irrelevant point first. Regardless of what you call it, as my colloquy with Justice Thomas tried to get at, the, the, the reason we have a plain text requirement has less to do with whether you call it a reservation or a dependent Indian community and everything to do with the fact that these boundaries were set up by Congress. And so if you are going to undo that, Congress needs to speak and Congress needs to speak clearly. We're talking about transfers of sovereign rights. And that has to be done clearly in the text. And you can call it a reservation or a dependent Indian community. The test would be the same. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Kagan? So if I could pick up on that, Mr. Gershon Gorin, uh, you said irrelevant and wrong. And the Chief Justice asked you about our two cases, uh, Sandoval and Creek Nation. And uh, I wasn't sh quite sure I understood your answer to him about how those cases were using the term and whether that is consistent or inconsistent with your argument. So though it is consistent with our argument. As I, under, as I read both Sandoval and Creek Nation, it is using the term dependent Indian community to, to describe the um, tribes, basically tribes broadly, that uh, those are, are communities over which Congress has the power to legislate um, under its uh, under its Indian related powers. In other words, it was not using it in sort of the more narrow and technical sense that Congress did in a, when it enacted the 1948 statute. So, in other words, it's, it's supposed to be an umbrella term. That's exactly right, Your Honor. It, it, but the, I, are standard reservations. Exactly. It includes standard reservations. It includes, but it's not limited to standard reservations. The whole point. How do we know that. Because that's what the court said in Sandoval is that um, the is that um, that it was in, it was trying to figure out whether Congress had the power to legislate for the Pueblos and and it, what it said was Congress has the power to has legislate both domestic and, um, and old and new um, communities and use the term dependent Indian community. But again, regardless, the tribe has always, the, the Creek have always been, the reason the, the Pueblos were compared to the Creek is because the Creek were assumed to be the quintessential reservation. In other words, if the fee patent in the Pueblos couldn't be a problem because it wasn't a problem for the Creeks and everybody understood the Creeks were, had a reservation. I think that was the sense in which the court was using the term. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Gorsuch? Hello? Justice Gorsuch? Thank you, Chief. Uh, counsel, um, we've heard a little bit about it today, but I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to discuss it further. Um, the, the argument that there are going to be terrible practical consequences that would follow from a ruling for your clients. Uh, we can put aside the criminal convictions. You've addressed those, but just the on-the-ground difficulties we've heard about uh, in administering Tulsa. Um, 
A, do you want to respond to the, the, that parade of horribles generally? And B, how should that inform uh, our analysis of an interpretation of a statute and a treaty? So, Your Honor, uh, I would, uh, broadly, here's what I would say. There, are, there, there will, of course, be consequences from the court's ruling, as there are from any of the court's ruling, and those consequences are not trivial, but nor are they existential, nor indeed overly serious. But more important, they are the kinds of consequences that happen routinely in Indian country. They are routinely resolved by agreement in Oklahoma, as Representative Cole's brief indicates, and throughout the nation, as the NCI brief um, and the experience of Tacoma indicates. And, and this, these are routinely addressed by Congress. Um, with respect to how it should, should influence the text, it should not affect the reading of the text, and that's true for several reasons. First, the text is what the text is, and this court's job is to interpret it. Second, in Parker itself, the court distinguished the two. It separated reservation status from questions of sovereignty and the impact on the ground, and I think this court should take the same approach. Those two questions are distinct. And then third, it shouldn't affect um, this court's analysis of the text because Congress is in the best place to change the text and add text if it wants. And indeed, Congress routinely does in Indian country, and Congress has in Oklahoma. There are Oklahoma-specific statutes that address environmental matters that take power for that ensure that power stays with the state, not the tribe. Congress knows how to do this, and the job to fix any consequences if the court perceives them is with Congress. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chief, and good morning, Mr. Gershengorn. I want to talk a bit about the history and maybe uh, make a comment, and you and other your colleagues can react. Uh, but this is not a situation where there's a reservation in an existing state, and Congress has arguably diminished a reservation. Uh, this is a case with a territory that by 1890, Indian territory was predominantly white. Uh, about 60% of the population, also a significant black population, about 10%, and about 30% Indian. And the question, as of 1890, how did we get there uh, to that situation? You go back to the treaties of 1832 and 1833 that grant the Creeks and the five tribes land. But then the Civil War is key, and the tribes, the five tribes all align with the Confederacy in the Civil War. Uh, the tribes have black slaves. Uh, lots of black slaves. And then there's a new treaty in 1866 because the United States is not happy that the tribes have aligned with the Confederacy. And why does that matter for us? Because in that new treaty in 1866, it grants rights of way to railroads. The railroads lead to settlements. The settlements lead to new towns that are predominantly white. So by 1890, you have an odd situation of an Indian territory nominally that's predominantly white. So Congress's options at that time are, are to remove the, the whites, to remove the Indians. Neither of those was going to happen. So the other remaining options were tribal government over non-Indians, which, of course, is contrary to uh, tradition, or to create a new state. And Congress chose the new state option, it seems, and then had a lot of things that happened over the next 17 years. So I just wanted to get that history out there, because I think we're talking about Indian territory and reservations when in fact it was 60% white, 10% black, 30% Indian in the relevant territory. Council, you have time for a very brief comment? So I'll just say very briefly, Your Honor, after statehood, 85% of the Indian territory remained in Indian hands immune from taxation. The idea that statehood and reservation status are inconsistent is refuted by the fact that Tennessee was 75% reservation at statehood. At statehood in South Dakota, it was 47% reservation. I think Your Honor's sense of the history and the incompatibility of reservations with statehood is not historically accurate. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Kanji. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. I would like to go straight to Justice Thomas's question about the governing framework here and make three points. First, there is nothing radical about the Parker Solemn framework. It's used to ordinary principles of statutory construction and fundamental principles regarding the separation of powers. Uh, the state can't win under that test, and hence it has advocated uh, various amorphous 
alternatives. I think, Justice Thomas, nothing about the fact that there was a series of statutes here changes the, the fundamental principles that should apply. Uh, there are, to answer your question directly, other cases that have involved a series of statutes. The Matz case involved a tremendous amount about the history of California, a series of statutes and executive orders over time. Psalm involved the creation of a, of a reservation only eight months before statehood. Every state likes to claim that its history is exceptional, uh, but there's nothing about Oklahoma here that should cause a divergence from this court's test. And the Thank you, Counsel. Um, I'd, I'd like to return to uh, Justice Alito's question. Congress passed legislation at the turn of the prior century saying that the United States laws and the laws of Arkansas, which would be applied in Oklahoma, uh, would apply to all persons therein, irrespective of race. Now, if you prevail, uh, the laws in the eastern half of Oklahoma uh, will be different. The applicable law will be different dependent upon race. So how is that consistent with uh, Congress's legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. It's a critical question. What the 1897 statute did was to apply federal law irrespective of race. Uh, the territorial law and Arkansas law as assimilated. There was nothing radical about that. Under the Gen General Crimes Act uh, and the Assimilative Crimes Act, state law was often applied uh, where federal law did not exist. But then what happens, of course, is this watershed moment of statehood. And statehood always changes the status quo. And when it comes to Indians, what it does typically is reserves federal power over the Indians while, of course, giving state power over non-Indians to the states. And there's nothing in the Enabling Act or the Five Tribes Act that suggests that that status quo, the normal way of dealing with it, was supposed to be departed from. Uh, but they, I, I would like an answer to the a precise question, which is law would be different in eastern Oklahoma depending upon race, right? Well, under the Enabling Act, yes, the, the transfer to the state was of cases that would arise under state law, what the federal courts retained with cases arising under federal law, and that, of course, included the Major Crimes Act and the, and the General Crimes Act. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, Mr. Conzi, brief question. Um, and this is just, um, uh, it's not necessarily dispositive of this case, but I'm interested in your answer. Do you think a a uh, tribe can be effectively divested of title to land, to its land and uh, its sovereignty, and still retain uh, the status of reservation. It's, it's a it's a critically interesting question, Your Honor. All all disestablishment cases involve a transformation of title. Uh, whether the, we are talking about trust cases or fee paid cases, Congress was getting rid of communal property uh, title and transferring title to individuals. So the question this court has always asked in that regard is whether Congress also meant to go beyond that and alter reservation boundaries. Um, with, so there, and here, where we simply are talking about the allotment and the opening up of small town sites to non-Indian settlers, that falls squarely into the rubric uh, that this court has designed where reservations have remained intact. With respect to sovereignty, if a sovereignty was to be completely divested, and that's not what happened here, but if it was, I think the question this court would ask is whether the federal government still main, meant to maintain the reservation for its own purposes. If it didn't, then the reservation would dissolve. Here, if the tribe had been uh, dissolved, the treaties make very clear that the reservation itself would have evaporated. But, uh, but I, and I understand this is not the premise of your question. That is not what took place here. The 1901 and 1906 acts clearly maintained a quantum of tribal governmental power. Thank you. Justice Ginsburg? If you, you are right, then what becomes of all the state tribal cooperative agreements that we're told about? If the state lacks authority to apply its own law to then increase territory of remaining at the session, um, that everything except what was Civil War. All, all of the, we're told that there are many, many state tribal cooperative agreements, but if the state lacks authority to apply its own law, what becomes of, of all those state tribe cooperative agreements? 
The, the agreement, Your Honor, will remain in full force and effect, and this is critical. If we prevail, state law does not evaporate from the reservation. Under this court's doctrines, state law applies in many situations with respect to, uh, especially with respect to the non-Indians in the area, and that's what leads to these cooperative agreements. Reservations involve uh, the different jurisdictions all having authority. And that has been the premise of shared jurisdiction that's underpinned uh, these cooperative agreements. And the best thing I can point you to is not my words, but the words of uh, Congressman Cole's brief. And that's a remarkable brief. I think very few briefs like that have been filed in this court in the area of state tribal relations where you have senior members of Congress, former governors, former state legislators saying, please do not disestablish this reservation because the exercise of tribal sovereignty in cooperation with the state has underpinned these agreements. And the authors of that brief were the authors of many of the agreements on the state side, and it's this premise of shared jurisdiction that has allowed for shared governance in Oklahoma to the benefit of all citizens there. And Thank Justice you, Counsel. Justice Breyer? So I'm still uh, interested in this claim that the state makes that whether it's a reservation or not a reservation is beside the point. But all we have to decide here is whether Congress gave to a state court the power to try the state criminal crimes. And Felix Cohn points to three things where he thinks the answer to that question is yes, seems to. First, they abolished tribal courts and put the criminal jurisdiction in the Indian court, the Indian territory courts, which were federal courts. Then in the 1906 Act, it says that those territorial courts, which were federal, have the power to try state law cases. Now, they're not called state law cases then. They're called laws of the territory of Oklahoma. And then in the 1907 Act, uh, which is... Um, uh, after, you know, the Enabling Act, it says all causes, civil or criminal, shall be proceeded with, held and determined by the courts of the state coming about, the successors of the district courts of the Territory of Oklahoma and the United States courts in the Indian Territory. So it's rather ambiguous, this last thing. But given the practice, and given Felix Cohen, and given you could read it that way, what do you think? I, Your Honor, it would make my life much easier in this case if I could say there was plain text that had transferred jurisdiction to the state over the Indians. As you know, there would be nothing inconsistent with that and reservation status, but we simply can't find that text. I think the operative text is, as Justice Alito said, ends up being the amended Section 16 of the Enabling Act. Prosecutions for all crimes which, had they been committed in a state, would have been cognizable in the federal courts. Uh, Justice yes. Alito? Justice Alito? Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, could you finish your answer to Justice Breyer, please? Absolutely, Justice Sotomayor. The uh, cases that would have been cognizable in federal court if Oklahoma had been a state included uh, prosecutions under the Major Crimes Act or the General Crimes Act. The Enabling Act is very clearly saying that those are to be transferred to federal court. Uh, as to the practice, um, this is critical. Uh, nationwide, around the nation, states were irrigating criminal jurisdiction to themselves, and the federal government was advocating it, even in cases where the reservations clearly remained intact. That happened in South Dakota, the Solomon case. That happened in Nebraska, the Parker case. That happened in Washington State, the Seymour case. That happened in Mississippi, the United States v. John case. In all four of those cases, this court unanimously, across different eras, different compositions of this court, paid no heed to that practice. For this fundamental reason, the acts of executive branch officials cannot subvert the will of Congress. Those acts of executive branch officials do not run the gauntlet of bicameralism and presentment. And here is all the more reason not to pay those heed. We know, we know that federal officials were subverting the will of Congress in Oklahoma. After uh, statehood, 
They would not allow the Creek Nation to hold elections for chief. It's national council, even though the Five Tribes Act clearly preserved those powers. So why we should pay heed to the acts of federal officials when they were clearly acting illegally is something that the state has, uh, has never explained. Counsel, could we go back to Justice Thomas's question? Um, am I to understand that in uh, existing reservations outside of this Creek Nation issue, um, there are uh, fee simple possessions by non-Indians. Non-Indians are living, working on those reservations. And am I to understand there's concurrent federal, state, and Indian uh, jurisdiction over many of the issues involved with those people? Correct, Your Honor. Wherever there's fee simple land in, in a reservation, uh, there is concurrent jurisdiction. So you really can't tolerate... So, uh, Justice Alito? Uh, am I correct that more than 90% of the people who live in the area directly affected by this case are not members of the Creek Tribe? Uh, that is correct, Your Honor. Well, what would you say to those people uh, when we, uh, if we decide this case in your, in your favor? Won't they be surprised? to learn that they are living on a reservation and that they are now subject to laws imposed by a body that is not accountable to them in any way? There, there are a number of responses, Your Honor. First, very little will change for them. Certainly, very little to the bad will change for them. They will largely remain subject to uh, state law. They will benefit in significant ways from reservation status. Justice Breyer asked the question at the last argument about the Tulsa businessman. Well, that businessman could wake up the day after the argument and qualify for enterprise grants that attach to reservation status. Well, what, what, would be the, what would be the extent of the tribe's authority over these non-Indians? For example, if any member of the tribe has a contract dispute with a non-member, say it's about an employment contract or a lease or the purchase of goods, Will the, the tribal member be able to sue the non-Indian in tribal court under tribal law? In, in, no, Your Honor. In, in Assuming that this takes place on fee lands, which is, the, as you've noted, the majority of lands in the reservation, under this court's precedence, it's clear that absent affirmative consent, uh, no, that case would proceed in state court. Uh, the tribe presumptively, tribal law presumptively, would not apply to non-Indians with respect to activities taking place on fee land. Well, if this were a, a different reservation and a non-Indian chose to do business there, knew that he or she was entering a reservation and was doing business there, that would be considered to be consent, would it not? Yeah, well, the, this course precedents are honestly a little unclear on that, but if there was some form of affirmative expression of consent, that would bring the case within tribal jurisdiction. Justice Kagan? Uh, Mr. Kenji, could I ask you to continue, and in, in you're talking about uh, the consequences of this, and focus particularly about adoptions and foster care proceedings, because I know there's been some concern about that. Thank you, Your Honor. There, there's been some, uh, well, frankly, rhetoric about that, uh, but it's misplaced on the ground. The state agency, the Health and Human Services Agency, and the nation cooperate in every uh, ICWA case. They have a terrific relationship, and they have both been involved in the placement of Indian children. That will not change if the reservation boundaries are affirmed. Um, there are various mechanisms to formalize uh, that. Those agreements, Section 1919, allows the state and the nation to continue sharing jurisdiction for the state courts to retain jurisdiction where there are, are existing placements, or under Section 1915 for the nation to ordain those placements. Um, there is simply no cause to think that existing placements will be disrupted. That is not in the interest of the nation, the parents of the children, and it will not happen. And with respect to all of these disruption questions, what role do you think that our decision in the city of Sherrill plays? Well, uh, Sherrill has a... a has a Cheryl is always in the room when the states and the tribes are negotiating agreements. It's really honestly a thumb on the scale on the side of the state. So when it comes to all the uh, fabric of cooperative agreements we have in place currently, those will continue. Um, we have ter terrific working relationships, as the cold brief exemplifies, and it will continue to play that role. Now, if there were ever a situation 
where the nation were to uh, assert sovereignty uh, in a way that went beyond the bounds of those agreements and that the state uh, took umbrage with, you know, Cheryl is an arsenal in, in the states um, uh, that the states can employ in, in those situations. So what Cheryl makes very clear is that there's a clear distinction between reservation boundaries uh, and whether they exist or not and what equitable defenses might apply to the assertion of tribal authority within those boundaries. Justice Gorsuch? Counsel, <clears throat> there's been a fair amount of discussion so far this morning about the Oklahoma Enabling Act and the suggestion that it's inconceivable that Congress would have admitted a new state to the Union where a significant portion of the state would have been a federal reservation subject to the Major Crimes Act. And I'm not sure we've given you all a, a fair chance to have at that, so I, I appreciate a, a thorough response to that question. Uh, thank you, Justice Gorsuch. There's nothing inconsistent between the advent of statehood and reservation boundaries. The Solemn case makes that patently clear. The uh, Cheyenne River Reservation and the Rosebud Sioux Reservation were ordained uh, eight months before statehood. Congress clearly, un and they, they accounted for about 10 percent of the state's land mass alone. Uh, Congress clearly understood at this time that states could come into being with significant um, reservation masses. Arizona became a state shortly after Oklahoma. That was 27 percent of the state's uh, land mass. This court by that time had recognized that state jurisdiction in the criminal area and the civil area could pertain to non-Indians uh, on reservations and had established this framework of uh, concurrent jurisdiction that still persists to today. Thank you, counsel. Justice Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning. Uh, as I mentioned in the last comment, I think we have to understand what the situation was as of 1890 to understand the text of these statutes, but I want to focus on the text, in particular the text of the statute that abolishes the tribal courts and the text of the statute that creates, in essence, municipal towns within Indian Territory during the 1890s. Uh, and what the significance of those two statutes are for assessing uh, sovereignty, because ultimately the question, as Justice Thomas suggested, I think, is uh, what, what's the status of legislative, executive, and judicial power? How should we think about those statutes with the tribal courts and the municipal towns? Mr. Chief Justice, I need just one minute to answer this question because it's, it's critical, uh, and it's an excellent question, Justice Kavanaugh. With respect That's exactly how much time you have. <laughs> Thank you. With respect to the courts, it's critical to remember most tribes did not have tribal courts at this period of time. It was a rarity that the five tribes did. So in restricting and then eliminating those tribal courts, uh, Congress was merely putting them on the same plane as other tribes. And then more generally speaking, with respect to the quantum of governmental powers, as you know, Justice Kavanaugh, Congress has regularly adjusted the meets and bounds of tribal sovereignty. That's what this court recognized in Lara, but has never equated uh, the quantum of power with the existence of the reservations themselves. And it's this On the tribal court's point, uh, the difference, I think, some would say, is that the other tribes were not governing a jurisdiction that was predominantly non-Indian, uh, which is what was going on here. Any reaction to that? Yes, look at exactly what happened in 1901 and thereafter with the Allotment Act. The tribal courts were gone, but the Secretary of the Interior continued to enforce the tribe's legislative authority. Section 42 made it very clear that that legislative authority persisted. The Secretary enforced uh, the tribal laws, and this court's decision in Hitchcock and the Eighth Circuit's decision in Buster make it crystal clear that the tribe's legislative authority persisted after the acts in question were, were enacted. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. General Manzinghani. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Oklahoma has jurisdiction over the eastern half of the state because it never was reservation land and is certainly not reservation land today. To start, the land was not public land reserved from sale, where title remains with the United States, but instead patented in fee to the Creek Nation. That is why this court in U.S. v. Creek, Creek Nation called it a former dependent Indian community. And under Venati, it clearly lost that status when the fee patent was dismantled. Now, assuming the land was a reservation, Congress stripped away all semblance of reservation status. Solemn 
asks us whether Congress's purpose was to divest the tribe of all its interest in the land. And here, statute after statute did precisely that. The Curtis Act ended tribal governance of the land. The allotment agreement divested the tribe of all its right, title, and interest. And even allotments were quickly stripped of federal superintendents. Everyone at the time read these statutes to mean the state had jurisdiction and the land was not a reservation. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, uh, Mr. Gershon Gorn, in response to a question from Justice Kagan, uh, uh, argued that dependent Indian community was an umbrella term that included reservation. I'd like to get your response to that. I think that definition would completely make uh, 1151B surplusage. It, it would read it right out of the statute. What this court said in Venati is that tribes with land and sea are, quote, unlike Indians living on reservations, citing Sandoval, which compares the, the, the Pueblos, who had a dependent Indian community, uh, as essentially the same as the five tribes. And in Creek Nation, this court said that the five tribes had a fee symbol, not the usual Indian right of occupancy, which is what is typical of reservations, and it was a dependent Indian community. And then Congress went out and codified Sandoval uh, as, a, as a type of uh, a, a land status separate and apart from reservations, uh, which is what this court held in Dinatai. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Thomas? Uh, yes. Um, counsel, the, uh, I'm very interested in your point that this, we should characterize this as a dependent nation. Uh, first, I'd like you first to say uh, whether why you think that and why it matters. Uh, uh, opposing counsel seems to think that it's irrelevant, and as he said, as I recall, that it's also wrong, your assessment of that. So it gives you an opportunity to both respond to that and to explain to us why it is important. So why it is a dependent Indian community? First, as I said, the uh, Venati said that tribes with holding their land under restricted fee are unlike Indians living on reservations. Sandoval and Creek Nation confirmed that. And as far as it doesn't meet the definition of a reservation, I'll take the definition from Hagen to Utah, land belonging to the United States that is reserved from sale and set apart for public uses. And in Pine River, this court said, reserved from sale means the fee remains in the un United States. Well, issuing a fee patent is not reserving from sale, it's selling it. Why it makes sense. It, making land alienable to non-Indians in a dependent Indian community ends the dependent Indian community status. That's what this court said in Venati, and that's what then Judge, Judge Gorsuch at the Tenth Circuit said in Hydro Resources on page 1163 and footnotes 11 and 30 of his opinion. And that makes textual and logical sense, because there's a textual difference between 1151A, which says that a reservation remains one, notwithstanding the issuance of any patent, and 1151B, which doesn't contain that language and defines dependent Indian community. Again, Judge Gorsuch pointed that out uh, in Hydro Sources. It also makes logical sense because um, if what created the land was uh, uh, the, the fee patent, the opposite of that, the conveyance of the fee patent, it disestablishes. That's in accordance with this court's decision in Hagen v. Utah, where it said reservation is reserving land from the public domain, so restoring land to the public domain ends the reservation. Justice Ginsburg? Um, if, the, if the tribe, if the reservation had been dis disestablished, would the tribe have any governing authority? And if so, over what? Would the um, Major Crimes Act apply, or would exclusive prosecutorial authority for state crimes lie in the state court? So the tribe would have uh, their governments in that they would have control over their own internal affairs and managing their property interests, which if you look to the tribal understanding at the time, as we as you quote in our respondent's appendix, is exactly what the tribe understood their own authority to be. As far as would they have any authority over uh, land, there is some land that is under their original fee patent. So the River Spirit Casino in Tulsa is built on the riverbed of the Arkansas River because that land was never allotted. So they have governing authority over that land, over trust land, 
uh, and over uh, restricted allotments, but we think the state nonetheless has jurisdiction over all of the state pursuant to the transfer of state to, uh, to state jurisdiction in the Enabling Act, uh, which, you know, the, the what Congress had done in the Indian Territory is say the Indian Territory is an area where Indians and non-Indians are treated alike. And the Enabling Act in Section 21 extended federal law except where not local or where locally inapplicable. And it was locally – the Major Crimes Act was locally inapplicable in the Indian Territory because the 1897 Act is the act that conferred jurisdiction, not the Major Crimes Act, which is why Petitioner can't cite a single Major Crimes Act case during this period, before statehood or after. This question was asked before, but what of uh, what of the congressional prescription that in Oklahoma all residents are subject to the same law, irrespective of race? I think that lays the framework of what Congress was trying to do in uh, make in in creating the state of Oklahoma, which was to transform the governance of the state and the land ownership of the state, which was exclusively tribal, to a place where both Indians and non-Indians could both own land and be governed by the same state government. If you look at pages 23, 22 to 25 of our brief, we lay out that history um, and, and lay out that that is what Congress said explicitly in legislative reports, that's what the Dog Commission report said, and that's what the tribes recognize in their own tribal understanding. Justice Breyer. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll pass. Justice Alito? Justice Alito? Yes. Uh, Mr. Gershengorn has a section of his brief that's labeled The Sky Is Not Falling. And his argument is that uh, you and the federal government are exaggerating the effect of this decision, that it won't have such a major impact either in the criminal or in the civil area. Is he right in that? No, Justice Alito. So let me, let me put some, some solid numbers on this. We have currently over 1,700 inmates whose crimes were committed in the former Indian Territory who identify as Native Americans. So the state presumptively would not have jurisdiction over those people and have to release them. And that is probably half the actual number because it doesn't include crimes committed against Indians, which the state would not have jurisdiction over. So we're talking here about potentially around 30, uh, over 3,000 inmates we may have to uh, turn over. Uh, as far as future cases go, there were 32,000 felonies con committed in the former Indian Territory, an area that is about 12% Native American. So only including crimes committed by Native Americans, that'd be 4,000 new felonies a year that the federal government would have to prosecute, including crimes that where the Native American is the victim. You can take that to about 8,000. On the civil side, what uh, the, on the civil side, what happens is it creates precisely the differential legal treatment between non-Indians and Indians that Congress tried to abolish when it, when it created the state of Oklahoma. So uh, 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 non-Indians would not be subject to, uh, presumptively, to state zoning law, to dog law, as Justice Breyer mentioned, and that creates a disparity between Indians and non-Indians. So now Indian business, non-Indian businesses are competing on an unequal playing field with Indian businesses. That's just one example. Uh, the Tulsa brief points out examples of, on restricted allotments, how uh, Indians are erecting billboards in residential neighborhoods or selling fireworks in them. But, but that's in the few areas, the 2% of land that remains restricted allotments. If the entire area is a reservation, uh, then you're, you're creating the two separate societies that Congress has sought to abolish uh, when it passed the, the dozen statutes it did in creating Oklahoma. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, um, with the latter part of all of the parade of horribles that you set forth, Congress can come in and change all of that. Congress can give the state jurisdiction over anything it might be missing. Um, if we were to hold this was a reservation, they have done so with respect to many other reservations across the country. So this is easily fixable by Congress. Putting that aside, um, what do we do with the treaty language here that uh, resulted as, um, after the Trail of Tears with the Creek Nation. 
that nation was wrenched from its homeland, marched to Oklahoma, and then given a treaty as recompense which guaranteed its sovereignty. I'm not sure that there's any other dependent Indian community that depends on a treaty right that extends or recognizes sovereignty. So can you point to any? Number one. Number two, if there isn't, why aren't we back in Solomon and Parker? Is there anything explicitly that terminated the reservation in the history that you've recounted? Uh, let me try to take those questions in order. Congress can't fix the retroactive consequences here. As far as the, the, the dependent Indian community, I think the Pueblos have sovereignty over their land. It may not have been via treaty, but the idea that a dependent Indian community versus reservation turns on treaty rights would actu uh, is actually nowhere present in this court's case law. It, uh, and on top of that, would actually undermine lots of reservations that were not created by treaty but by executive order, so petitioner's position would actually undermine Indian country around the country. Uh, and then third, as far as specific language, I think I'm going to go to Justice Thomas's point, which is session, as this court said in Rosebud Sioux, means the surrender of territory or jurisdiction, and here you have the explicit surrender of territory and jurisdiction. The Curtis Act said tribal law shall not be enforced. The, the, the allotment agreement said all right title and interest is divested. You combine those two things together, that's enough to to say that there was no reservation status. But on top of that, you have a bunch of other statutes that do even more things than that that, that make it absolutely clear. The Justice Kagan? Uh, General, if we could go back to this dependent Indian community question, uh, which is a complicated one because, of course, our, our use of language can change uh, over such an extended period of time. But when I look back at some of these cases that were decided around the same time, the Creek Nation was decided. It seems as though the case for Mr. Gershengorn's view, which is that this term was meant to be an umbrella term, is, is, is a pretty strong one. And specifically, a case called McGowan, which relied on another case called Pelican, talked about the broad use of the term uh, dependent in Indian community and said that whether, it was a, whether something was a reservation or a colony, was irrelevant uh, because both were dependent Indian communities. And then um, uh, uh, Felix Cohen says in his treatise, uh, speaking of these cases, he says, and I'm quoting here, all Indian reservations are also dependent Indian communities unless they are uninhabited. So uh, could you comment on that? I think you have to read it uh, as well, uh, taking into account Venati, um, which says that uh, tribal tribes with their land and fee are unlike Indians living on reservations. Uh, I, I don't think you could read 1151B as just uh, completely the same as what's in 1151A and, and, and C. But more than that, a reservation has to be land reserved from sale, and here the land wasn't reserved from sale. It was sold. It was it was given to the Creek Nation in exchange for their lands in fee simple. Uh, so if well, that's a different kind and... of argument. Excuse me, General. That's a different kind of argument. That's that's the argument that fee simple is itself inconsistent with reservation status. And aren't there other tribes that also have been given land in fee simple that have been recognized as reservations? No, and, and thank you for the opportunity to address that. So the Creek Nation points to the Seneca in New York as having fee simple, but they yielded their land not by session, but by selling all their right to private parties in 1797 and in 1842. So under their theory, all of western New York and the city of Buffalo is still an Indian reservation, which would be highly disruptive. They also point to the Wyandot in 1817 treaty, but they neglect to mention the 1818 supplemental treaty that relinquished the right to a patent and instead gave them a, a reservation. So our position would disrupt no land anywhere. And, and, and in 2015, by the way, the Second Circuit looked at the Seneca's restricted sea land in the Buffalo area, and it said, you know what it is? It's a dependent Indian community. Since Thank then, you, Council. Uh, court, Justice Gorsuch? Council, I have four questions. I'm going to tick them off as fast as I can, and you can choose which ones you want to respond to in the time you have. First, 
Um, can you explain to me why the fact that the land is in fee simple would lead to a less a stringent disestablishment test than solemn? I guess I don't understand why that would be the case. Second, um, at least in the briefs, you make a lot of later demographics and evidence about what's happened. Um, I, I guess I'm struggling to think why that should be uh, relevant in an interpretation of statutes from the last century, uh, especially when the later demographic evidence sometimes shows nothing more than that states have violated Native American rights, uh, including Oklahoma's, for example, enforcement of its state laws on on uh, tribal lands against tribal members in the past. Uh, and then third, uh, practical impossibility arguments. Um, if you could address what's wrong with what uh, is in, in the brief by Robert Henry about how states often work with tribal uh, entities. And then finally, fourth, uh, I would have thought that after Carpenter versus Murphy, we might have seen a tsunami of, uh, of cases if there were a real problem here that we haven't, we haven't seen. So any of those you want to take up, feel free. I'll do my best, Justice Gorsuch. Why does it mean less protection? We're not saying it's less protection or more protection. That is a false paradigm. Congressional intent controls regardless. 1151 is not a sliding scale of protection with reservations or dependent Indian communities being more or less. Now, they did have more rights with respect to the title, which is why Congress decided they needed tribal agreement, but the tribe agreed to divest itself of that title. Uh, but when it comes to dependent Indian communities, what, what you said in Hydro Resources and what Venati said in, um, is that dependent Indian communities, when, when the land becomes alienable, it's no longer part of the dependent Indian community. And that's based on the text of textual differences between 1151A and 1151B. Uh, as far as what happened uh, upon statehood, we're not relying on what happened 100 years after statehood. We're relying upon the tribal understanding, the federal understanding, the understanding of federal judges during the process and as the process was being implemented. Federal judges at the moment of statehood transferred cases involving Indians to tribal, uh, to state courts. And the tribes understood, as we prove in our respondents' appendix, that they would be subject to state law. So what we're talking about here is the original tribal understanding and the original public meaning. And what they are trying to do is impose a modern lawyerly gloss on statutes enacted 100 years ago. So if you look at the original understanding of how everybody implemented it, it is completely uh, uh, as Oklahoma is doing today. The, the fact that there was, there's no tsunami, we've had 178 people already seek relief uh, un, under Murphy, even though the Murphy mandate has been stayed and the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals decision is still binding on state courts. So that 178 cases are just the initial cracks in the dam, and that doesn't even include the state court filings that our office isn't, isn't notified of. Uh, so I, I don't think that you can say that there's, there's no tsunami coming. And then as far as practical things, yes, we're going to try to work with the tribes as much as we can regardless of how this decision comes out. We work with the tribes on a day-to-day -day basis in doing a lot of great things in the state of Oklahoma, but that Justice doesn't stick Kavanaugh. with the retroactive. Justice Kavanaugh? Thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning, General. Uh, I want to pick up on your comment earlier that Congress made clear that uh, Indians and non-Indians were to be treated alike, uh, and to pick up on Justice Gorsuch's reference to demographics. Uh, and follow up on what I said uh, in my earlier questions. My understanding is that as of 1890, this was a very unusual situation because it was already predominantly non-Indian in Indian territory. Uh, and that put Congress in a very difficult position of figuring out what to do. Uh, and I think that um, it's necessary to understand to figure out what the text of these statutes uh, mean. So I, I guess my question on demographics is, People talk about the demographics now. The demographics in 1890 were also similar. How should that affect what we're thinking about? And more particularly, can you connect that up to the text of the statutes that Congress enacted in that 17-year period to transition to statehood? Certainly, Justice Kavanaugh, and I think that's the right way to look at it. By statehood, 90% of the area was non-Indian. And I think what that means is that you have to figure out what Congress was trying to do, which is abundantly clear from, uh, the, uh, from the history, which is Congress is trying to un 
undo the tribe's exclusive ownership of the land and exclusive governance of the land because there was no territorial government to give it to a new state that would both that would govern the land, uh, non-Indians and Indians alike, and where Indi- where non-Indians and Indians alike would would own the land. That is nothing like any of this court's previous cases. Uh, Mr. Gershon Gordon was not able to point to any case that was anything like that. And so how that connects to the statutes? Well, if what Congress is trying to do, and this is very clear from the history, Congress was trying to transform both the jurisdiction and the territory and the land ownership. Well, the Curtis Act transformed jurisdiction. It says tribal law shall not be enforced. And the, 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 um, uh, the allotment agreement transformed the land tenure. Now, the other side says, well, we could still levy taxes. Taxes were affirmatively abolished in the Five Tribes Act, so they can point to no actual tribal power that existed. The one power they can appoint to was abolished in the Five Tribes Act. Thank you, Counsel. General Mus- uh, Deputy General Needler. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. In preparing the Indian Territory for statehood, Congress eliminated all the hallmarks of a reservation. Congress broke up the tribe's national domain and extinguished the tribe's interest in it. Congress likewise eliminated the tribe's territorial sovereignty over that area by abolishing tribal courts and prohibiting enforcement of tribal law in territorial courts. At the same time, Congress eliminated the distinct treatment of Indians under federal law. It instead subjected all persons in the territory, irrespective of race, to the same courts and body of law largely incorporated from the state law of Arkansas. And Congress carried forward that framework for the new state. It directed that Oklahoma law would apply throughout the former Indian Territory and provided for the transfer of criminal and civil cases involving Indians and non-Indians alike to state court. Congress did not then radically change course and impose a a reservation-based jurisdictional regime throughout eastern Oklahoma upon statehood. Mr. Needler, um, the Creek land was owned by the tribe in communal fee, unlike the situation on uh, most reservations. Uh, Could you explain the consequence of that for the uh, analysis in this case? Yeah, I think it's it's significant, and I think it strongly supports this establishment here. The, uh, the, The tribe had fee ownership as part of setting aside the territory for its nation to be undisturbed, and the, and the uh, treaties provided that no territory or state would be created there. So after uh, all the non-Indians moved onto the territory, Congress concluded that was untenable, and it had to break up uh, the nation, and that included both the fee and the, um, and the sovereignty. And so what, when Congress provided for allotment, the tribe specifically ceded its interest in the land, conveyed its interest in the land to the individuals. And because the fee was the hallmark of their sovereignty, what made them separate, the tribe's own conveyance of the fee to individual members and extinguishment of all interest in it extinguished their sovereignty uh, at the same time. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Needler, uh, the, um, in Solom and Parker, we had uh, clear reservations, uh, the, um, the, and it was pretty standard. And uh, then you had uh, uh, an effort to, uh, to dispose of uh, or to alienate surplus land. Here, this is entirely different. Um, have you seen a case like this in which we have applied the Solomon Parker framework? I, uh, I have not. And the, the point you made earlier, that Congress, in, in all those earlier cases, the court was really trying to discern the consequence of a surplus land act standing alone. Here, you have other statutes that specifically address those consequences. Each of those cases arose in deciding whether federal law would apply or state law would apply. Here, Congress answered that question directly. There's no need to infer that from the Surplus Lands Act alone. Congress, in preparation for statehood, provided that the same laws would apply to Indians and non-Indians and then turned over a territory with those attributes uh, uh, to the new state. 
and immediately upon statehood, when that compact of statehood was entered into, the state courts started to exercise jurisdiction over uh, over Indians in that territory in fulfillment of Congress's uh, preparation. And that was done pursuant to an act of Congress. It's not simply a consequence uh, of surplus uh, of surplus lands. All of that is the consequence of Congress's preparation for statehood. Thank you. Justice Ginsburg? One of our statements that an allotment conveying the title and interest of the tribe, an allotment unlike session, doesn't diminish a reservation. There's uh, there's no a priori test for that uh, for that proposition. The important point here is that in, when Congress started the move towards statehood, the preparation for statehood, it did that in the Dawes Act in, 19, in 1893, and that act provided that uh, for the Dawes Commission to negotiate for session, for allotment, or such other method that that uh, could be accomplished in preparation for statehood. Congress regarded whatever method could be worked out as the prelude to statehood. And the reason for prelude to statehood is because Congress was preparing to substitute the state for a territory, just as it has done with all territories in the past. The only difference here was that there was no territorial government separately established. It was the territories and the governments of the tribes, which Congress essentially prevented from enforcing their laws uh, and created a situation where the land with that characteristic could then be transferred to the state with Indians and non-Indians uh, treated alike. I think this question has been asked before, but when the tribe, not the United States, the tribe holds, holds title to treaty guaranteed land, uh, you say we should apply a less stringent standard for disestablishment. Why? Uh, I would think that you anticipate an even stronger showing when it is the tribe itself, not the United States. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a less standard, uh, it's, a, it's a less stringent standard. What I'm saying is that what Congress did uh, needs to be understood in the historical framework uh, in, in, which it, uh, in which it acted. And the framework that was uh, understood by everybody concerned at the time of statehood, the, the, the compact of statehood that, that provided for this, it wasn't conferring jurisdiction on the state. It was part of the compact under which the state came into the union that in eastern Oklahoma, as was prepared for it by Congress, Indians and non-Indians were treated alike. That was the deal, and that was followed through with by transferring cases involving uh, non-Indians. And the, the uh, thank you. Uh, if we decide that Solem doesn't apply here or there's an exception, then you would win, I, I assume. Let's assume that. Uh, but would that not cause the same practical problems elsewhere in the country? For 35 years, people have lived under Solem. If we change it or make exceptions, won't there be places where people bring lawsuits, and people who are in prison, and they say, we were tried in the wrong court? The same circumstances here. We thought we were a tribe. And the prisoner says, no, you're not a tribe. And vice versa. So why does the, chain, why does the uh, uh, parade of horribles work in only one direction? Departing from no. Solon, you get the horribles. Regardless, we, we think this is a compelling case under Solon, uh, but, but also that the court has to consider the application of Solon with respect to the unique history of, of Oklahoma, Oklahoma. There is no other territory of the United States converted to statehood. That, that isn't quite my question. My question is, if we make an exception from Solon, or if we change Solon, is there not likely to be the same kind of parade of horribles elsewhere? I don't know the history of every tribe in the United States, and though you know a great deal about it, I'm not sure that you do. Uh, 
um, created I'm sorry. No, go ahead. If you point. created an exception to Solon, uh, it would be an exception that would no doubt be based on the unique circumstances of this case. Again, this, uh, it, unlike in Solon and other cases, there's not just a Surplus Lands Act. You have these other specific statutes directed at the consequences of disestablishment, the, the, the attributes of disestablishment. Uh, and I'm unaware, and we haven't seen in the eight or nine or ten disestablishment cases this court has had anything resembling that, where there are separate statutes implementing. Uh, uh, oh, do you know what happened, say, in Alaska or in Hawaii or in uh, Wyoming? Have you all looked into this and said, if you create an exception uh, and uh, there's no one else who could qualify for that exception? No one has identified. We, we, we have not. And of course, in Alaska, there are no, uh, no re reservations at all. In Wyoming, there's one reservation. Uh, so n nothing like this uh, has surfaced. And again, this has been the case for 100 years in Oklahoma, more than 100 years since Oklahoma entered the Union on the understanding that Indians and not Indians would be treated alike in the eastern half of that new, of that new state. There's Mr. nothing like Needler, that. Uh, Mr. Needler, the broad question whether the Creek Nation has a reservation or whether it's a dependent Indian community has all sorts of implications. But what I'd like you to address is whether we can decide this case on a narrow ground, because after all, the only thing that's involved here is a criminal prosecution. So if we were to look at the narrow question whether Congress has provided for the trial of cases like this one in state court, what would an opinion like that look like? What would it look to? The 1897 Act, the uh, 1906 Enabling Act, and the amendment in 1907, uh, the way these laws have been interpreted for 100 years, what would an opinion like that? I think it would, I think it would look at all those things. And again, what happened prior to statehood is highly relevant because all everything Congress did was in preparation for statehood. So the limit, so the subjecting Indians and non-Indians to the same laws was part of the, the package that Congress incorporated into the new state at statehood. So the 1897 and 1904 uh, acts uh, are are critical, and the Statehood Act, uh, which provided for the transfer of cases to state jurisdiction, was contemporaneously construed and applied by those responsible for implementing it. Well, what would you say to the argument that we shouldn't look to the way it was interpreted right after statehood or for many decades after that because those people were proceeding in bad faith. The statutes were clear and they and the state was simply usurping authority and the federal government was going along with it. There, there's absolutely no basis uh, for that. Uh, the, uh, the, these are federal judges, federal district judges, federal uh, Indian court judges, and state court judges, and, and state court prosecutors. Everybody on the ground understood that. There was a case in this case court called Hendricks, which proceeded on the assumption that an Indian in the Indian Territory had committed a crime. Uh, his case should have been transferred to state court. There was some special statute that said otherwise, but the premise of the whole case was that his case would have otherwise gone uh, to state court uh, in Oklahoma. And the, the, it's important to understand that the tribe understood that, and I urge the court to look at the statements by the principal chief of the, of the Creek Nation in 1906, after the, uh, uh, the uh, Five Tribes Act was passed. And he said, upon the establishment of a state government, all powers over the governing even of our landed property will cease except insofar as the distribution of our property and money is concerned, which will be entirely Justice, under Justice Sotomayor? Mr. Needler, I understood that statement was in light of the existing congressional disestablishment legislation that Congress subsequently changed and didn't go through it. But putting that aside, um, I, I haven't figured out whether you've accepted um, the Oklahoma suggestion about the dependent Indian community exception or argument? Are you endorsing that argument? No, not, not, in, not in terms. Um, 
Uh, we're not. I mean, this court has, has, uh, has discussed dependent Indian community separately. But some of what informs uh, the state's argument, we think, is very important, as I said before. That the, this the is state state, but let's go back to, is there a consequence that we're unaware of if we were to describe this, res this creek this question here, um, which is, what do we do with, if we say this reservation was this established, under what theory would we recognize Indian sovereignty over lands they kept? It was either disestablished or not. And why well, would all the complex laws that exist now giving the Indians the reservation, uh, the uh, casino rights and uh, jurisdiction over lands that they own and, and all of those other things, what would be the basis of keeping all of that? Well, it, it's pretty it, old. It was disenfranchised. It's commonplace that when a reservation is disestablished, those parcels that remain in as allotments or tribal trust land or, or uh, of the sort uh, remain Indian country. And so uh, saying the reservation was disestablished, which has been the assumption for over 100 years, would not change anything on the ground because the and, and Oklahoma has always been understood where a lot that allotments are the fulcrum of tribal and individual uh, activities. Uh, Thank and you, this, Mr. Needler. Uh, Justice Kagan. Uh, Mr. Needler, I understand you want to support Oklahoma's position in this case, but just to follow up on Justice Sotomayor's questions about what Indian, uh, what dependent Indian communities were or were thought to be in 1935. Do you think that those concepts were mutually exclusive, a reservation and a dependent Indian community? I think there was a lot of overlap, and the you know sort of the bottom. Congress, the court often described them as general in general terms as land validly set apart for the use of Indians as such under the superintendence of the government, uh, and that that phrase appeared in in Potawatomi in describing is there a difference between trusts and and reservations. Uh, so the, the same general concept is there, except for a reservation, as opposed to an allotment, for example, it's, it's uh, owned collectively. And so when the land is broken up, as it was here, particularly when it's broken, when it's sea land that is broken up, and when someone conveys their interest in sea to, to somebody else, they are conveying all of their interest in it. It's not like trust property uh, on the typical reservation where, the, where when it's allotted, the United States retains... Uh, an interest, and therefore, on behalf of the tribe, in some sense, retains an interest. When it's sea land, it is conveyed out of the tribe, and the tribe loses all of its interest uh, in the land. And that's particularly clear under this uh, allotment agreement, because it provides that the United States also um, extinguished, by approving the deeds, extinguished its interest in the land. And that interest was a reversionary interest for when the tribe uh, was disappearing. And so by, by relinquishing the United States' interest in that land at the same time it was conveyed to the individual allottee, it made it clear that the tribe as sovereign was being – its sovereign authority over that land was being eliminated. Thank you, Mr. Needler. Justice Gorsuch? Mr. Needler, um, tell me what's wrong with this sequence of, 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 of my understanding that Congress did establish something it called a reservation with respect to this property at some point in time, that through the 1890s and the early part of the last century, there was an awful lot of debate about how to, how to end that reservation, whether they could end it in anticipation of Oklahoma becoming part of the Union. And that things got very complicated, and they came mighty close to ending the reservation, but never quite passed the kind of language that we typically see when that happens, uh, re re reversion of all lands to the public uh, domain or cessation or anything like that. In fact, the Dawes Commission couldn't admit it, couldn't quite get there. And so you're really left to rely mostly on a lot of demographic evidence both then and now, which, while not everybody's acting in good faith, not, every, uh, not everybody's acting in bad faith, too, as some have pointed out. And it's a mixed bag, and it's very hard to make much of it um, and to rely too heavily on demographic evidence 
is dangerous because you, in, in, some, in some ways, incentivize people to ignore the plain terms of the law. Uh, and, for example, as I pointed out earlier, I think it was until the 1970s that Oklahoma continued to try and enforce state law against Native Americans on a lot of territory. I, I believe I have that right. So tell me what's wrong with that understanding, please. Well, uh, first of all, I think there's a big difference between demographics before and after statehood. The, demog the overwhelming presence of non-Indians in the territory was precisely the reason why Congress said it won't work to have, it, have tribal governments running this. The tribes couldn't exercise jurisdiction uh, over the non-Indians. So what Congress said is this area needs a government for and by both Indians and non-Indians, and it established that in the territory so that it could hand that arrangement over uh, to the new state. And it was this court's decisions uh, uh, say that the contemporaneous understanding of what Congress is doing is significant. The original public meaning of what, uh, what was done and everybody, the state understood it, the state, or the, the, the state obviously implemented its compact of statehood, the federal government understood it, Felix Cohen understood it. The commissioner of Indian Affairs at the time said there's only a shell of the government of the tribal government left. The tribal chairman, said, the tribal chief, said the same thing: that all we are in a position to do is uh, distribute the property, uh, and that that is. And even the case that uh, uh, petitioners and, and the tribe rely upon uh, the Harjo versus Kleppe specifically says that. The tribe lost its territorial sovereignty, even though it had uh, uh, the authority to run its internal affairs. So, Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning, Mr. Needler. Uh, I'm going to follow up on a question Justice Sotomayor asked and one Justice Gorsuch asked. Uh, Justice Sotomayor mentioned quite rightly the 1832 and 1833 treaties. Um, my understanding, however, was that the 1866 treaty uh, made clear that those treaty rights were, I don't know if the word is superseded, but diminished because the tribes had aligned and made a treaty with the Confederate, Confederate States of America, and the treaty language in 1866 said that that had unsettled the treaty relations. Uh, Anything you want to add on the 1866 treaty, the relevance of that? Yeah, I, I don't think it adds uh, significantly uh, to the point, except that it, it reflected a, an assertion of a greater um, federal responsibility in the territory, and it was contemplated that Congress could pass laws uh, uh, governing the territory. Um, uh, I did want to make one point about practical consequences on the criminal side. Not only would this, would this uh, jeopardize all the prior convictions on the state side, but it would impose uh, great uh, burdens on the federal government. Uh, it's estimated a 1,300% increase in criminal prosecutions uh, brought in state court. And then, of course, for the state, uh, there, there would be questions of taxation and whatnot. And, and I don't think City of Sherrill, which has been suggested, is a solution to that. Can I ask one other question, Mr. Needler, to follow up on Justice Gorsuch? My understanding, given the demographics as of 1890, was that it would be very hard to have a tribal government over the whole territory because of the population uh, at the time. And my question is, what tribal authority, judicial authority, or legislative authority, to your knowledge, was exercised over the whole territory, including the white settlers, in 1890 through 1907? It, it was the, the tribes had no authority over the white settlers, which is why Congress put in place the, uh, the courts for the Indian Territory and put in place federal law, mostly incorporating Arkansas law, to govern Indians and not Indians alike. And that is the regime that Congress passed on from the territory uh, uh, to the new state, and the new state received and has been faithfully applying that uh, ever since statehood. And thank and you, Mr. Nigar. Mr. Gershengorn, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. A number of things. Justice Gorsuch, first, you're exactly right. This court may not be able to determine which party has the better reading of events on the ground 120 years ago, but it is surely well positioned to determine which party has a better reading of the text. And on that score, I submit this case is not close. 
Second, Justice Ginsburg, two points. With respect to fee title, that was meant to be an additional protection because everyone understood the imperfections in Indian title. The Creek didn't even get their patents until 1852, 20 years after the reservation was, was given. The elimination of fee title does not eliminate treaty promises. Those have to be disestablished through plain text. In addition, Justice Ginsburg, you're exactly right. The right title and interest language, which is the only text the other side can point to, conveys only proprietary interest, not sovereign interest, and so there is no textual um, transfer. There has been a lot of talk discussion this morning about irrespective of race. It is one quick point on that. When Cong in the Enabling Act, in Section 13, what Congress put in place was the laws of the territory of Oklahoma, which did not have this supposedly magic language about irrespective of race. That suggests that Congress well understood that the arguments the SG and the Oklahoma are making on this score are, are made up for today. For, there was an, a lot of discussion about whether there's a compromise available on criminal jurisdiction. There is not. Justice Alito listed a number of factors for Mr. Needler. One of the missing ones was the text. The text is very clear. I was amazed that Mr. Needler said there was no basis for believing that there was um, ignoring of the text. Nagansett said that is true. Secretary Udall's memo listed seven states in which it were true. Finally, the numbers today are mind-boggling and back of the envelope. They don't appear in any of the briefs. They're, the only fixed number is 178 petitions that dwarfs Ramos. I understand the court's concerns about jurisdictional consequences, but there are no serious disagreements that these disputes are common in Indian countries. Counsel, can the, case the case is submitted.
We'll hear argument next in case number 19267, Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus Agnes Morrissey Beiru and the consolidated case. Mr. Rasback. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. If separation of church and state means anything at all, it must mean the government cannot interfere with the church's decisions about who is authorized to teach its religion. In this country, it is emphatically not the province of judges, juries, or government officials to decide who ought to teach Catholic fifth graders that Jesus is the Son of God, or who ought to teach Jewish preschoolers what it means to say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And at bottom, that is what these cases are about. Who controls who teaches the faith to school children? Under Hosanna Tabor, the answer is easy. Churches must choose those who, quote, teach their faith. Indeed, that is one of the most important religious functions for any religious community, passing the faith on to the next generation. And since the teachers here were the church's primary agents for teaching the Catholic faith to fifth graders, teaching them for hours a week, much more than the parish priest, they fall within the ministerial exception immunity. Respondents would have the court ignore all that, substituting a formalistic standard that relies first and foremost on the employee's title to determine whether the ministerial exception applies. That would wrongly elevate form over function and force judges to decide what titles sound religious enough to qualify, and it would hopelessly entangle church and state. Unsurprisingly, no court has ever adopted respondents' title test. If respondents' arguments give some members of the court deja vu all over again, that is because respondents have recycled many of the arguments the court unanimously rejected eight years ago in Hosanna Tabor. The pretext inquiry, the notice requirement, the idea that freedom of association makes freedom of religion entirely unnecessary, all were raised in Hosanna Tabor and rejected unanimously. Eight years later, respondents' arguments are not any more convincing. In short, there is no reason for government to get in the business of teaching religion. The Ninth Circuit should be reversed. Counsel, you uh, say in your brief that personnel is policy um, and that teachers, as part of their job, uh, personify church values. Is that enough to trigger the exception in your case? Uh, I, I think in, in this case, I don't think that's something you have to address, and I don't think that it would uh, personification. Well, I don't, I, I don't have to address it, but you do because I asked. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, I think on on the basis of personification alone, I, do, I don't think that that would necessarily uh, uh, mean that we would win the case. Um, I think that the the right answer is that it's um, something they were what functions were they performing, and those functions were uh, to teach the faith for hours on end uh, over the course of a week. Does your argument, uh, both with respect to personifying values uh, uh, as a factor uh, and with the other functions that the teachers might perform, uh, uh, apply in the case of teachers who are not Catholic, because many uh, Catholic schools hire teachers who, who aren't? So, so I, 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 I don't think it, it does. Uh, Hosanna Tabor uh, rejected the idea that there was a problem with non-Lutherans teaching Lutheran doctrine to Lutheran kids at a Lutheran school. Um, and ultimately, religious bodies get to decide who best performs those important religious functions. And courts really shouldn't be in the business of second-guessing that. Uh, I would point the court to uh, some of the briefs, uh, for example, the Stephen Weiss Temple brief, which talks about how difficult it would be for uh, Jewish entities if they could not uh, hire non-co-religionists. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, counsel, how would you, how exactly would you go about, uh, or a secular court go about determining whether an employee's duties and functions are religious or whether they're important? Well, I, I think, I think the, the best way to think about it is uh, with respect to the uh, religious part of it, I think you you have to you can look at the the list of things that this court talked about in Hosanna Tabor, uh, so teaching, preaching, as well as uh, the the list that was in the uh, concurrence by uh, Justice Alito, uh, and look at those as a kind of safe harbor uh, in terms of if one of those things is present, then uh, then it clearly is an important religious function. Uh, but then if you if you uh, let's say you have something where the, the church is 
or, or the religious defendant is raising some other uh, thing as an important religious function, then I think uh, you probably you you would you would have to look do some deference to the church's understanding of that. Um, so, and, and this is pointed out actually in the brief by Professor McConnell, uh, where he talks about substantial deference on both the importance question and the re uh, religious question. Thank you. Justice Ginsburg? I would appreciate your answers to two questions. One is who among the religious schools employees, who among them are not ministers. The second question is one that the chief uh, already alluded to. Um, you do not have to be Catholic to be a fifth or sixth grade teacher. How can a Jewish teacher be required to model Catholic faith contrary to his or her own beliefs? How can a Jewish teacher be a Catholic minister? Uh, so to answer both of your questions, Your Honor, uh, with respect to who is not covered, uh, I, I think it would include uh, anyone who's not performing important religious functions. So, for example, uh, the janitor. And there you have the Baltimore Hebrew Congregation uh, case that we cite in our briefing where uh, the janitor, uh, although he did explain what a sukkah was to uh, the school children, uh, still did not uh, did not uh, want that to he that did not qualify him him as a minister uh, and that was decided under Hosanna Tabor uh, I think the same thing would be true of someone who for example is um, just doing the uh, IT for the, the company or the school um, as for uh, yes, the, coaches. yes are the coaches they would be ministers too I, I don't think a coach did you say coach your honor mm-hmm uh, yes, uh, I don't think a coach would necessarily be one. It would really depend on whether the the person, the particular person, is performing important religious functions. Um, if they're just a coach and don't do any kinds of functions, then they would not come in under the exception. Suppose they lead the the team in an opening prayer. I think that uh, if they do an opening prayer, uh, you know, for what that's, you know, I think that there would be. Just saying that, just doing that would probably come uh, within something like the Sukkot situation with the Baltimore Hebrew Congregation case where it's essentially de minimis. Uh, it's not something uh, that, that by itself uh, does that. I think in reality that's not going to be a very big class of cases because usually if they're doing, leading a prayer before the game, they're also doing a host of other kinds of activities. Justice Breyer? I think that the statute itself provides for a religious exemption for hiring the person of a particular religion where that's connected with the carrying on of the religious organization's activities. There is also the BFOQ, the bona fide occupational qualifications. So I thought this case has to do where a religious organization might dismiss someone on the basis of race or religion or national origin where that isn't related to religious, uh, uh, where that isn't related to the carrying on of the religious activity. For example, a person who's handicapped. Now, why should the minister, isn't it enough to have the ministerial exemption apply to that kind of thing? That is, whether a person holds a position of religious leadership or authority. Well, there's different, different kinds of evidence that would show that. So why do you need more than that? Well, I think it's, I think it's because of the Establishment Clause, Your Honor. The, uh, you know, this is not just a sort of bilateral interaction between the, the employer on one side and the employee on the other. There's also a, a third ox that's getting gored here, which is the society's interest in not controlling religious functions. You know, we have a, a system of separation of church and state, and uh, the process of teaching school children what to believe. Uh, on the basis, I don't want to interrupt, but on the basis of what you say so far, I take it to my question, which is what do the religious organizations need other than 
The exception in the statute, the BFOQ, and the ministerial exemption is confined to leadership, and your answer seems to be they don't. No, no, they, 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 absolutely, they, they absolutely do, Justice Breyer, and, oh. and, and because, because to have control over what they are doing and to be able to uh, per, control the performance of this important religious function, conveying the faith to younger kids, that, that, is a, that is a free exercise right that they absolutely have and should have, and I don't think that the BFOQ exception or Title VII or any of the other uh, religious exemptions can overrule that. Justice Alito? Well, let me follow up on that question. The, the religious exemption, if it applied here, would permit the school to hire only a Catholic to teach the, this, uh, in this capacity, right? It would, not, uh, it would not address the question whether the school could dismiss somebody who is a Catholic because that person is not teaching the faith in the way in which the school wants. Is that, is that a correct understanding? I, 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 think that, I think that you're right, Justice Alito, in, in this sense. Uh, the hiring and firing uh, are clearly covered by the ministerial exception, but there are other kinds of uh, religious autonomy doctrines that might come to bear. If, for example, you know, the example we used in our briefing of uh, the, the employee of the uh, synagogue school who starts wearing anti-Semitic T-shirts to school, that, is, that has to be covered by other kinds of religious autonomy and First Amendment doctrines, uh, not just uh, the ministerial exception. Um, so even if the janitor did that, it would fall under one of those other kinds of uh, doctrines, not under the ministerial exception itself. Well, I took Justice Breyer's question to mean why isn't the exemption in Title VII uh, that allows uh, 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 religion to be a, a qualification for certain jobs sufficient to address the question of a teacher who teaches religion in a religiously affiliated school. Right. So it, it is true, Your Honor, that the um, the if you if the person is is teaching uh, is not. If the if the bona fide uh, if the if the BFOQ exception uh, applies here, it, it it wouldn't actually uh, cover most of the kinds of uh, people that carry out the important religious functions. So there's a disjunct between the two things. Thank you, Justice Sotomayor. Counsel, there's a difference between a teacher who teaches a religion class in a secular school and a teacher who teaches religion in a religious school, but I'm not sure what the difference is. Meaning, can you point me to anything in the evidence that the teacher here was acting any differently working from a workbook for her religious class than a teacher does in a secular school? That's my first question. My second question is, I think what's being confused here is that you're asking for an exception to law that's broader than the ministerial exception generally and broader than is necessary to protect the church. The two teachers at issue here are not claiming that they were fired because the school thought they were teaching religion wrong. One says she was fired because she came down with cancer and was fired for a medical condition. The other claims it was because of age. She had been there for many, many years and had been very acceptable um, to the school, and all of a sudden she reaches a certain age and she's fired. So you're asking for an exception to the Family and Medical Leave Act, to wage and hourly laws, um, to all sorts of laws, including breach of contract, because at least one of the schools here, contract with the teacher says they won't discriminate because of the teacher's age or disability. So you're asking for something broader than giving the, the schools the power to hire or fire certain kinds of people because of how they teach the religion or don't teach it, 
and you haven't explained to me why it's necessary. I don't understand what leadership role or proselytizing role these teachers played in simply teaching about religion. So, so Your Honor, they, they absolutely were doing much more than teaching about religion. They were teaching it devotionally, and they were, they were proselytizing. They, their job, number one, and their overriding commitment was to, to teach these kids to become Catholic and to believe in the Catholic faith. So I don't think that uh, – I, I just – I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. Uh, with respect to, you know, religious reasons, first, first of all, you know, the – Hosanna Tabor rejected that, that exact same argument and said it missed the point of the uh, ministerial exception. And the reason it missed it was because it's inherently – it's inherently entangling to transfer authority and control over a position that teaches the faith uh, devotionally from church to state. So the Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Hagan? Uh, Mr. Rosbeck, I have a too long list of hypotheticals, so I'm hoping that you can answer them in just a few words, like basically, yes, he qualifies, no, he doesn't qualify. So here's the first one. Um, a, a math teacher who um, uh, is told to teach something about Judaism for 10 minutes a week. Uh, and if he's teaching it uh, devotionally? If this is all, that's all you know about him. That's all I know about him. Uh, then I, then, then I, would, then I would say probably not, uh, because okay. it would be demanding. The math teacher who um, comes in, and you, you mentioned the Shema at the beginning of your remarks, uh, very important there, takes about 20 seconds to say, a math teacher who was told to begin every class with a, a leading the Shema. I, 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 don't, I don't think that that is uh, likely to fall within it because I think it would, again, be okay. minimus under a, the table. A math teacher who is told to embody Jewish values and infuse instruction with Jewish values. If it's that alone, probably not, but it really depends on how that okay. cashes out in actual Yeah. Okay, practice. I really am ask, asking these things alone. Uh, a nurse at a Catholic hospital who prays with sick patients and is told uh, otherwise to tend to their religious needs. I, I think a nurse doing that kind of counseling and prayer may well fall within the exception. May well fall within it, okay. Yes. Um, a press or communications staffer who prepares press releases for a religious institution of all kinds that they need. Uh, that that should fall within it because of communication under as Alicia Hernandez case from the Seventh Circuit. Okay, uh, a counselor at a church-affiliated rehab clinic who urges his patients to reconnect with uh, their faith community. Uh, that that would be a probably, but it depends on how much connecting there is. Okay, uh, an employee at a soup kitchen who distributes religious literature and leads grace before meals. Uh, my guess is that that would be de minimis under the same kind of rubric as the Davis case that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, a church organist who provides musical accompaniment and selects hymns for services. I think that that usually would fall within it because that's an important religious function and uh, that's the main job. Okay. Uh, a cook who's actually not Jewish but who prepares co kosher compliant meals for children at a Jewish school. Uh, no. No. Okay. What's the uh, – you, you got through them all. Thank you. What's the <laughs> connection? What's, what are we supposed to draw from this? Well, I, I, again, I think, it's, I think we laid it out in our, in our briefing, and that is what, is what is it that this person is doing performing on behalf of this religious body? So what is, the, what is the function that they're performing on behalf of that body? It's not all religious exercise. It's a subset of the different kinds of religious exercise that are out there. Uh, it is, it, and it is the kinds of things that were listed in the Alito concurrence. It was listed as the sort of verbs that we uh, teased out in uh, the main opinion in Hosanna Tabor, which is uh, preaching, teaching, guiding, communicating, things like that, that that are that are crucial to what you do as a religious organization. So, I, Justice I, Gorsuch, counsel, I'd like to follow up on on uh, Justice Kagan's line of questioning. In response to a number of them, you indicated that you thought that the uh, religious activities were de minimis and therefore wouldn't qualify. You're asking a secular court to make that judgment. 
and even when uh, some deference is given to a religious organization in a qualified immunity sort of way or otherwise, <clears throat> you're still asking us to make a judgment between who qualifies as a minister and who does not on the basis of our judgment that their activity with respect to the religion is de minimis. And I'm, I'm just wondering, does that pose some problems for you uh, and for your clients in some of these cases? I, I can easily see a school in which everybody takes a pledge that everything they're going to do is to help teach these kids uh, to be part of the faith. And, and churches believe, unlike you know, some, but that, that every every member is a minister, um, and not just a, 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 a not just uh, uh, limited to clergy. Uh, so what do we do about that? Um, the next case is going to be a school in which uh, a janitor takes a pledge, or the school bus driver, or the coach, and they all believe sincerely that they are ministers, and you're going to have us tell them, no, your activities are too de minimis. Well, I mean, I, I think this is part of, part of the issue with, with the use of the word minister. This is a kind of uh, immunity that really goes to the co kind of things that are done, that are the kinds of things you would never contemplate having a governmental entity do. And so, therefore, uh, you know, it's true that they may well be within their faith tradition a minister, but the term minister, as was, you know, explained in, in uh, the colloquy, uh, one of the colloquies that Justice Scalia had in Hosanna Tabor, is that, it, that it, it's, a, it's a legal term here. It's a, and it, was, it arose in the 1985 Rayburn case. So I think that there's a, there's a real uh, – there's, you have to see it as a subset of the kinds of things that are done on behalf of the religious community that make it distinctive. So it's not going to cover the gas station attendant or uh, the, the bus driver. It has, to, it has to go to those functions that make religious, uh, religious communities distinctive within our society. Justice Kavanaugh? Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, good morning, Mr. Rosbeck. Uh, do you think the exception applies to teachers who teach religious doctrine or teachers, uh, perhaps more broadly, who teach religious values? Uh, how would you answer that question? Which of the two are you looking at? Yeah, so I, I think if, if, there, if, if, a, if a teacher is teaching religion devotionally, doctrine, values, what, what have you, or just religious practices, then that teacher is going to come within the exception. And one way to think about it is this is an establishment clause rooted doctrine. So there's a, there's a sort of heuristic here where if it's something that you would start to feel nervous about having in a public school, uh, done by public school teachers, then how can you turn around and reach into the religious, private religious school and have the government tell them how to arrange those affairs? So I think that a number of the questions so far have gone to the limits, uh, as it often happens, the limits uh, if you were to win this case. So we're thinking about uh, where it would go. And, and so say the English teacher who sprinkles in references to Matthew 25 and feed the hungry, or the art teacher who talks, talks about art in the Vatican, or the football coach who uh, says the memorare before every practice and game. Uh, the basketball coach who says, Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Uh, those kinds of things are definitely instilling religious values. Are those people therefore covered or not covered? I, I, I think that, that in, in most cases, it's, they, they probably would, if it's only that, if it's just doing the one thing, the sort of saying grace before meals situation, that that could be that that probably would fall outside the exception because it's not the it's not at the, the the heart of what they're doing. But I don't think that there's actually a whole lot of situations where that is is actually the only thing that such coaches or teachers I'm, I'm, or other. I'm not do. sure about that factually, and I guess the question that Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch asked is, uh, are we going to have litigation over? Uh, what particular students take out of particular coaches or particular teachers, uh, I'm not sure how we do that if you were to win this case and then we go on to the next case. I, I, think, that the, I think that your limiting principle is looking at you know, what was laid out in Hosanna Tabor. It's not just you know, the important religious functions are not just any religious exercise, but there's sort of a subset of religious functions that the person's performing as the agent of the religious community and that that's, you know, the main part of their job. So it can't be something where it's, it's uh, just 
uh, you know, something that you, you know, you have the, the physics teacher that has the crucifix on the wall. That's one thing. If you have the physics teacher who adds a sermonette to every single class, that's a different one, and that is... Thank you, Council. Ms. Ratner? Ms. Ratner? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. There are three proposed approaches to the ministerial exception on the table. First, in most lower courts, an employee's function has been central to the analysis. Second, in the Ninth Circuit, an employer must check off one or more formalities, even if an employee's religious function is clear. And third, in respondents' view, this court should go even further and make formalities the key with function serving just as a cross-check. The first approach is the right one. The touchstone of the ministerial exception should be whether an employee performs important religious functions. That's because function reflects the First Amendment interest at stake and because, critically, it's more neutral among different religions. Here we're talking about teachers of religious doctrine at a religious school. Under Hosanna Tabor, those teachers are ministering to their students by teaching them how and why to be Catholic. So they should fall within the ministerial exception regardless of what the school calls them. Council, uh, Hosanna Tabor looked at all of the factors in the uh, case, and the issue now seems to be what emphasis you should put on one of those factors, religious function, and what emphasis on a different one, the ministerial title. Um, I guess uh, in addressing that question, I'd like to repeat Justice Gorsuch's question uh, uh, to you as a representative of the government. How is, uh, is a court supposed to determine what is a significant religious function and what is an insignificant one? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, with respect to the first part of your question, we do think the court left open in Hosanna Tabor what is the appropriate methodology here. It said that expressly and repeatedly. And we think the reason why a function focused approach is, as I mentioned, that it, it advances the purposes identified in Hosanna Tabor. The, the way that one would determine whether this is an important religious function is first by looking to the categories set out in Hosanna Tabor, and particularly if the court were to pick up the additional elaboration in Justice Alito's concurrence, then we're talking about things like preaching, teaching, worship, leadership, and rituals. You have a pretty defined set that we think would cover the mine run of cases in this area. So it's not going to be an exceptionally indeterminate analysis. Just to underscore that, this is a concept that has been around in the lower courts since the 1980s. And so, again, it's not something that we're invented, inventing here or that these courts are going to significantly struggle with. Thank you, uh, Counsel. Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, uh, Counsel. Uh, my question is similar to that. I am perplexed as to what you do for example, with the chemistry teacher who starts class with a Hail Mary, or the uh, theology teacher, or the chemistry teacher who's a nun who starts class with a uh, chemistry class with a Hail Mary, or the uh, lay teacher who teaches religion but does it in a very straightforward, objective way. Uh, how would you handle those? I, I don't see how what standards a secular court would use to determine which of those is a uh, uh, function, an important uh, duty or function, a uh, religious duty or function. Sure, Justice Thomas. So we think that the important religious functions are those of the type that I mentioned before. And then the question in some of these cases that have been hypothesized is just is that really a meaningful part of a person's job? Or as petitioner's counsel called it, is that just a de minimis part of a person's job? If that job is, in one of your hypotheticals, teaching religion, then of course the answer is yes. If that job is teaching something secularly and we're talking about one prayer, then the answer may not be yes. But if, if I could give the court some comfort on this, there really have been three main buckets of recurring claims since Hosanna Tabor, and that's been principals and teachers of religious schools, worship musicians, and leaders of religious congregations. Those are the ministerial exception claims that we see again and again. 
And we think all of those would be resolved, or at least this court would set a clear path forward if it were to adopt a function-focused approach. Thank you. Justice Ginsburg? The breadth of the exemption is staggering. That is, these people are exempt from all anti-discrimination laws. So to take a stock example, suppose a teacher who does everything that two teachers in, in these cases do as a face leader also reports a student's complaint of sexual harassment by a priest and is terminated. She has no remedy? Justice Ginsburg, I think that question goes to the what is covered by the ministerial exception as opposed to the who falls within it. And on the what is covered, we're simply asking for the same thing that this court decided in Hosanna Tabor. And the court there specifically didn't decide whether things like retaliation for sexual abuse reporting would be covered. What it did decide was that employment discrimination claims that involve the hiring or firing of an employee necessarily go to a religious organization's ability to control who ministers to the faithful, and that those claims are categorically precluded. So we would apply the same rule here, and then the question is just what's the appropriate methodology for determining that a person is one who ministers to the faithful. But her having cancer has nothing to do with the performance of her religious functions. She needs time off, and the government says she should have time off to take care of her disease. Yes. Yes? So, yes, Justice Ginsburg, that is the assertion. But again, this court said in Hosanna Tabor that requiring a particular religious reason misses the point of the exemption and that it really is categorical once we're in the category of uh, employment discrimination claims relating to hiring and firing. So if it's categorical, why then isn't it take care of the teacher who reports a student's claim of abuse by a priest? So Again, I think that there may well be arguments that that type of retaliation claim would also have to be covered. My point is merely that the court avoided deciding that in Hosanna Tabor, and we think that it could continue to do so here. And it would be the same if what was reported that the principal of the school, Sister Mary Margaret, had been stealing from the school, from the school's till regularly to pay for her gambling excursions to Las Vegas. Teacher reports that, and she's terminated. So, Justice Ginsburg, again, all of this relates to what is the potential scope, what are the types of claims, and in particular, retaliation claims for which uh, the, to which the ministerial exception would apply. I think there are logical reasons why maybe some of those claims could come in, but we think the better approach excuse me, why maybe some of those claims would be covered by the ministerial exception. But we think the better approach is to continue to do what this court did in Hosanna Tabor and say, we don't need to decide those sort of outlier cases right now. We're deciding things that relate to the employee-employer relationship and a hiring-firing claim under the employment. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Justice Breyer? Um, counsel, I'd, I'd like to... Uh ask you about the, your categorical thought. Uh, as I understand it, this is uh, the kinds of claims that are brought are not about religion. Uh, there is a BFOQ and there is the religious exemption and taken together where the organization does something related to religion and that's why they dismiss the person. They're likely to win if the case is brought in the first place. We're talking about the kinds of things, anyway, that Justice Ginsburg raised. That's the kind of thing. Should there be an immunity there? And I think the court has previously decided, yes, there should be when the person is a minister. Because in that situation, don't even get into it, court. Don't even get into it. So who falls within the minister? Now, I can say easily, a person of leadership or authority. That's not going to help that much. So when you take your categorical approach, 
minister, person of leadership, person of authority, what do you want to add? How do we explain to people, in your view, what that should amount to? Well, Your Honor, I think at a minimum you need to add the other categories that you discussed in Hosanna Tabor. And it, you specifically said this doesn't just apply to leaders of the congregation. It applies to other employees who preach their beliefs, teach their faith, and carry out their mission. So we think that at, at a minimum those teaching the faith during the week to school children and not just those preaching the faith on the weekend to adults are included within that category. And then when we're talking about what it means to carry out the religion's mission, then we think that there are other categories, some helpfully laid out by Justice Alito's concurrence, like uh, worship, leadership, and rituals that would also come in. Why? Why, if it's a plain teacher and teaches religion too, why is it necessary to keep out of it entirely, even if that teacher or whoever administrator is, does discriminate on the basis of handicap? Because once you've made the decision that somebody is performing an important religious function, and this court said in Hosanna Tabor that getting into why they were dismissed misses the point, because at that point, the religious organization has to be capable of deciding who is going to minister to the faithful, who is going to fulfill that role of teaching Catholic school children that Jesus is the Son of God and God created the world and this is the appropriate way to be Catholic. Thank you. And Justice Alito? What do you think is the relevance of titles in this inquiry? So, Justice Alito, we think that, of course, all the considerations that this court mentioned in Hosanna Taper, including title, may be relevant. But the best way to think about them is that they may be relevant in illustrating whether someone performs an important religious function. And I think to do the opposite, to require a title as sort of a separate checkbox that needs to be ticked off, is going to create a real problem in terms of neutrality among religions. Some faiths have those sorts of formalities. Some faiths don't. I think a particularly salient example is that the Lutheran Church in uh, Hosanna Tabor had available to it things like called teachers and commissioned ministers. And those types of non-ordained ministerial-sounding titles just aren't used by a lot of faiths, in particular Catholicism, Judaism, and others. And so that's why we think that title and to the title, the existence of it, uh, can be used to help understand someone's religious role, but not as a freestanding inquiry. Well, how does it even help to understand the person's role? So suppose you have two people who do exactly the same thing uh, in two different religiously affiliated schools, but one has a title and the other one doesn't have a title other than the title of teacher. Why should the presence or absence of this title make any difference? So it shouldn't in a circumstance where we know clearly what individuals are doing. If it's a little harder to understand uh, based on the facts whether someone does in fact play an important religious function and it's a religion that we know gives out titles for uh, different types of religious functions, then perhaps it could shed some light on the question. But, but no, in a circumstance like we have here, where a teacher performs the exact same functions that Ms. Parrish did in Hosanna Tabor, then we don't think the absence of a title should make any difference. Okay, thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Sotomayor? Um, counsel, in your brief, you're encouraging us not just to define who's a minister by important religious function, but you're asking us to defer to the religious organization's determination of what's an important religious function. That's a recipe for saying the uh, teacher who says a prayer at the beginning of a class, every teacher, whether it's a math teacher, a computer teacher, a gym teacher, they're doing an important religious function because all the, all the school has to say is that's important to us, number one. Number two, um, I thought what Hosanna, our prior case, was recognizing is that when you're talking about a leader 
a, um, a person who's stewards of religion, uh, that they are entitled to this uh, absolution. You are now absolution from liability in law. You are now suggesting that we as judges have an obligation to expand the exemption that we've created in law. I thought that was always Congress who would do that, not us. And as Justice Breyer indicated, they've already done it. You're asking us to, to broaden that to anyone who does, whose job is not primarily religious in any way. And for decades, the lower courts, most of them, have not used any of the tests all of you are proposing. They've used the primarily religious, not, not important, but primarily religious functions. And I don't think that lay teachers who are hired as lay teachers, not as religious teachers, it's hard to see how they qualify as primarily religious leaders. So, Justice Sotomayor, on your first question, I want to be very clear. When we're talking about deferring to religious organizations, we think that this court has already outlined uh, sort of objectively what would be considered the class of important religious functions. And the deference we're talking about are in those rare cases where there's some dispute about whether someone actually performs those. Uh, there is a case where there was a question whether an organist is important to worship whether a Hebrew teacher at a Jewish school is important to teaching the Jewish faith, things of that nature. On your second question, uh, we agree that the ministerial exception applies to those who lead and steward the religion and perform other functions involving stewardship and personification of the faith, and that's exactly what teachers do. It's, the question really is just the methodology. Is this based on what you do or on what you are called? And uh, Ms. Rager, I was struck by um, the emphasis that your brief gave to the idea that it was not important whether an individual was a member of a particular faith. Um, as I understood it, that the central premise of the ministerial exception is that there are certain individuals within faith communities who have a, a particularly distinctive special role about how to propagate the faith. And if a position can be filled by any old person, uh, not by a member of a faith, isn't that a pretty good sign that the employee doesn't have that special role within the religious community? No, Justice Kagan, I don't think so. And, and, and there are really several reasons. The, the most important one is that's essentially a religious judgment about who is qualified to perform certain important religious functions and how much of the creed of that religion you need to share to perform that function. The second is that this is a really entangling inquiry to engage in in practice. And the third is that the result is going to have a disproportionate effect on minority religions. And I don't, I want to be clear here that these are not just abstract questions. One of the schools in this case, for example, said that it preferred Catholic teachers, but it would make exceptions for certain other Protestant religions like Lutherans. I don't know how to, whether to consider that, you know, a partial co-religionist requirement. I don't know whether that's different from a reformed Jewish school that would hire an Orthodox Jewish teacher. And I don't think that that's a road that the court wants to go down on and to go down, particularly if it has concerns about other potentially entangling parts of this analysis. In, in some of your uh, answers, you've talked a lot about the language in Hosanna Tabor, which was, you know, leading, preaching, teaching. Um, and, uh, but of course, Hosanna Tabor connected that up with the title, with the training, with the formal commissioning. And when you take all of those things away and you're just left with those terms, preaching and teaching, that's when you get into all the tricky questions, like how much preaching, how much teaching, of what kind, any, any prayer that you say during the day, any amount of teaching. Um, and so how would we deal with that? Again, I think the way to deal with that is by understanding there to be a baseline here, that the religious functions of the type discussed in Hosanna Tabor have to be a meaningful part of somebody's job duties. And so a lot of these kind of outlier hypotheticals 
that are suggested are not the circumstances where this even has arisen. The Thank you, Counsel. Justice Gorsuch? Counsel, elsewhere in the First Amendment and under RIFRA, uh, we have emphasized repeatedly that we do not inquire into how important uh, the, the plaintiff's religious belief is or how central it is to their faith. We protect any sincerely held religious belief precisely because we're afraid about entangling courts in making religious judgments and discriminating against minority religions that may have views about what's important that are unusual or different from our own. Here, however, it seems to me, instead of pursuing that line of argument and suggesting that the sincerely held religious belief about who is a minister should control, you're asking this court to uh, involve itself in deciding for itself who is and who is not an important minister or just a de minimis, I think is the words you've, you've used, person uh, in, in the teaching of religion. Doesn't that create just exactly the sort of entanglement problems that we've tried to avoid elsewhere and discriminate potentially against minority religions that may have different views of ministers than, than you or I may have? And you, you, you reject all these hypotheticals as speculative or haven't yet arisen but the very test you propose would seem to me to invite them. So Justice Gorsuch, a couple points. I, I think the first, the reason we have not advocated for a completely deferential approach is the reason Petitioner's Council alluded to, and that's that the ministerial exception is really a legal term of art. And so different religions may have different views on who constitutes a minister under uh, that particular faith, but that's not necessarily going to map on to the fear that this court has said has to be left to religious organizations. So we don't think that there's any way to entirely extricate yourself from this problem. And so then the question just becomes, what is the methodology? And if the worry is discriminating among religions and disadvantaging minority religions, then that's a significantly greater worry if we're talking about things like title and training than if we're using generalized Functional, a generalized functional approach that looks to the types of things that religions usually operate with across the well, board. Well, there exactly is the problem, usually, usually. And that, that discriminates in favor of majority conceptions about religious doctrine and teaching. Why couldn't we just simply say that a sincerely held religious belief about who is a minister should control, just like we do everywhere else in the First Amendment and in RIFRA? Again, uh, Your Honor, everywhere else we're talking about sincerely held beliefs for purposes of, say, a free exercise claim or a RIFRA claim. Here we're talking about a, a constitutional protection that this court has said is limited to those who are ministering to the faithful or who personify the church. And we don't think that's necessarily going to map onto the particular definitions of a minister that one uh, organization may use. And of course, Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Ms. Ratner. Just want to confirm that your view that the roots of this exception uh, are the Constitution, uh, not statute. And Professor Laycock refers to the principle of religious autonomy rooted in the Free Exercise and Establishment Clause. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I don't see how you could read the court's decision in Hosanna Tabor to adopt this as some sort of statutory uh, constitutional voice analysis in the same vein as Catholic bishops. I think it's pretty clearly a, a First Amendment holding in that case. So that's okay. what we're done. You use the phrase uh, teaching the faith. And of course, looking ahead, if you it was, your side were to prevail in this case to the future cases, what does teaching the faith mean? A uh, similar question that I asked uh, your colleague uh, about instilling religious values, not just teaching specific doctrine. You know, a school could have a uh, creed of instilling the value of being a person for other and all its students, and all the teachers and coaches are told to underscore that message and how they go about instructing or coaching the students. That's the religious value, and they're all told to... to uh, uh, pursue that in different ways. How do we analyze a case like that? So 
I think that those cases are obviously going to be more difficult. It's a heartland case when you're talking about the formal teaching of religious doctrine on a daily or near daily basis, as we have here and as the court had in Hosanna Tabor. If we're talking about something that looks more like modeling the faith, I think you're going to have to do a more context-specific analysis about whether, in practice, this particular position is expected to transmit the faith through that way. I certainly wouldn't say that categorically those individuals are, are either out or in. It will depend on what that means in practice. I, I just want to underscore here that the Ninth Circuit's decision is really the outlier decision. So with respect to all of these concerns about the repercussions, we're just asking you to eliminate the decision that has deviated from the general focus in the lower course on a function-based approach. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. Rastak, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, Your Honor, uh, uh, Mr. Fisher, you don't have sorry. anything to reflect just yet. Uh, yes, Mr. Fisher. Sorry. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Uh, I think the first half of the argument has illustrated the myriad problems with the important religious function test that's been proposed on the other side, uh, both in terms of consequences. For example, Mr. Rothbach readily admitted that, uh, that all nurses in Catholic hospitals, for example, would be covered, and in terms of theory, uh, as Justice Gorsuch's uh, question uh, illustrated. So I think I want to focus on the narrower argument in this case that I hear the schools and the government making, which is that uh, these particular teachers uh, should be considered ministers, uh, even though they did not have to be Catholic to have their job, simply because their job included teaching religion. And our position is the court should reject this contention for three reasons. First, the school's argument would strip more than 300,000 lay teachers uh, in religious schools across the country of basic employment law protections. And necessarily included in this number are teachers who teach so-called secular classes. Uh, this has been a focus of a lot of questioning this morning, so I want to emphasize this. The court itself and Catholic bishop in many cases has said in no uncertain terms that there's no way to distinguish a teacher who teaches religion in a religious school from a teacher who teaches general curriculum or a secular course infused with religion. And in fact, the schools own amici uh, from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to the American Jewish Committee and their amicus briefs are at absolute pains to underscore this reality. They emphasize that, quote, all teachers in religious schools infuse their instruction with religious doctrine, regardless of whether they teach, quote, religious or secular subjects, such as math and science. And if, in the concrete examples the court has offered uh, already, I think, make this readily apparent, but let me give you a couple more. Imagine the English teacher who teaches rhetoric using the Sermon on the Mount, or the history teacher who during Passover describes the exodus from Egypt, or who explores divine will through Lincoln's second inaugural address, or the science teacher who teaches creationism or intelligence design. I don't really understand what the other side means when they talk about de minimis teaching of religion uh, or outlier, uh, uh, I think was the word Ms. Ratner used, all teachers in religious schools are in play in this case, necessarily. Secondly, Mr. Uh, I, I think it's fair to describe your position compared to your friends on the other side uh, as more uh, formalistic in using that word in a non-pejorative sense. Uh, you're, you're much more focused on titles, I would think, than whether or not uh, they're performing religious functions. And my concern is, uh, uh, it was one raised by the concurring opinion in Hazana Tabor, is that different faiths uh, put different stock in, in titles, and some that are more hierarchical, uh, they're important, and others they're not. And the second concern is that that's pretty manipulable. Uh, you know, if you want broad protection, you just start handing out titles uh, to everybody, and then they would be uh, covered. I, I'd like your reaction to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, just so what our position is, to be absolutely clear, is the court should adhere to the multi-factor framework that Hosanna Tabor laid out, uh, which starts with what we would call objective factors. Yes, one of those factors is the formal title of the individual, but also things like the individual's training, whether the individual has to be of the same religion, et cetera, we think are good places for courts to start. Because, as the court has mentioned, the entanglement problems here are extraordinary. Uh, once a court turns to assessing religious doctrine and what is important and what, how religious values come into play. 
so, Mr. Chief Justice, you asked also about manipulation. Uh, I think you've actually had a little bit of a case study in the last eight years since Hosanna Tabor was announced. And what you see in the guides that we cite in pages 35 to 37 of our brief is religious employers looking to claim broad protection of the ministerial exception are being told to put things into their handbooks about the importance of the religious functions of the employees and to assign them daily prayer activities and the like. They're not being given special titles and the like. And we think the reason why is that titles themselves, even on their own terms, uh, are meaningful things. Uh, you can look across all sectors of American society, including churches, uh, to see that. But again, Mr. Chief Justice, we wouldn't rely solely on titles. We would just say it's an important thing to start with titles, just like the court did in Hosanna Tabor. Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, Mr. Fisher, uh, just uh, first a just general question. Um, would exactly what these teachers were doing be a violation if they did it in a public school? It would be a violation of the Establishment Clause if they did it in a public school? Well, Justice Thomas, I think there's a yes and no answer to that. Uh, I think some of the uh, religious teaching might step over the line, but of course it's commonplace for religion to be taught in public schools. And let me, let me clarify one thing that came up in the first half of the argument with Mr. Rosbach, for example, about teaching devotionally in a religious school. Uh, the document lay, Catholic, lay Teachers in Catholic Schools, which is cited in the other side of the Mikas brief, so it's kind of the touch point for what it means to teach Catholicism as a lay person, tells Catholic teachers that when they're, even when they're in public schools, they should teach devotionally. Uh, so it's not simply uh, the idea that a Catholic person is supposed to be a witness of the faith or even try to persuade other people to become Catholic that would be uh, uh, somehow different in a well, religious school. I don't want to cut you happen. off, Mr. Fisher, but what if they, uh, it's my understanding, they actually led them from time to time in prayer or took them to service, things like that. Um, that's what I mean. Just let's take not the sort of the minimal uh, performance of their duty, but the sort of their standard week-to-week -week performance. What could they do that at the local public school? Uh, I think, Justice Thomas, the answer to that is, is no. Uh, the, the prayer and worship would step over the line, but I don't think that tells you anything meaningful for in terms of what a minister is, because if prayer and worship were enough, uh, then you'd have not just the football coach or the administrator who gives the morning prayer over the loudspeaker in school, but you'd have the nurses in Catholic hospitals, you'd have the teenagers at summer camps who are camp counselors who lead their, counsel, have their campers in a prayer every night. So prayer is one thing to look at, uh, but just as Thomas, we don't think it's enough to make somebody a minister. But don't you think uh, it's a bit odd that, that things that would violate the uh, establishment clause when done in a public school are not uh, uh, considered religious enough for free exercise protection when done in a parochial school? Well, Justice Thomas, I wholeheartedly agree that free exercise protection is available in this case. And I want to make clear that uh, any religious reason for firing these teachers or for otherwise regulating the teachers would be entitled to the highest free exercise protection. But what the other side needs to prove is that there's an establishment clause violation in this case uh, with going forward. Uh, and we think that is something that requires more than simply leading people in prayer or the like. It requires being a leader in the church. It requires not just being a member, but a, a person in whom the stewardship of the congregation has been placed. And that's what raises the kind of establishment clause problem we think the ministerial exception is concerned with. So the, you, you rely somewhat on the, as the Chief Justice said, in a non-pejorative way, ministerial designation. Um, how would you determine that, especially when we look at these non-hierarchical religions that do not use priesthood or pastor and that sort of uh, uh, designation? Well, I think, uh, Justice Thomas, uh, the best way to do that in a, in a religion that didn't use the kind of titles that the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church use uh, would be um, uh, to do what Judge Wilkinson did in the Rayburn case, which is to say that if the person is performing all of the same things as uh, as, as what would typically come with a title, uh, then that may well be quite relevant. And I hasten to add, I just don't want to give the appearance that our test relies simply on title. The very next thing Hosanna Tabor looked at was the training reflected in that title. 
And so, and so even in religion that isn't hierarchical, you're, you're most likely going to have significant religious training of the kind uh, Ms. Parrick had in the Hosanna Tabor case uh, in play when you deal with a religious leader or the head of a congregation or the like. Uh, and so even uh, Justice Ginsburg. I had the same question you were answering about discriminating against non-hierarchical religions, and you're saying even those people, they have special training that distinguishes them from the lay members of the congregation? I think that will be true some, uh, quite often, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, as I said, I think the Rayburn case is a very good example uh, in that respect, uh, uh, which is, of course, the foundational case for the concept of ministerial exception. Um, one other thing I'd like to add, which is uh, I think it is correct, and we agree with the premise that different religions ought to be treated equally. Uh, but there's nothing I don't think that should uh, require the court, therefore, to have all people who perform exactly the same functions across all religions be treated the same. And if I could offer a rough analogy. Uh, think about the 11th Amendment immunity that applies to states. Uh, different states structure their own government differently. Uh, they have different forms of administrative bodies. Some have much bigger administrative bodies than others. And so different people in different states that perform roughly the same thing are sometimes going to get 11th, uh, sometimes going to trigger 11th Amendment immunity, and sometimes they're not. We wouldn't say, therefore, that we're treating those states unequally. Uh, we would say we're respecting the decisions, those choice, those schools, I'm sorry, those uh, states have made. And so too here, uh, I think part of respecting religion and staying out of religion is respecting the ex-ante decisions that churches themselves make about how to structure their hierarchies and who to give, uh, who, who, as the words of Fernanda Tabor put it, and whom to put their faith. And you don't seem to make much out of what I find very disturbing in all this. As a person can be hired or refused to be hired for a reason that has absolutely nothing to do with religion, like needing to take care of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, I don't want to give that impression at all. We think that's actually the center uh, of the case in terms of how this court should think about it. And this also connects up, I think, with Justice Breyer's questions. It's not just that there's a uh, exemption in the statutes for hiring people of the same faith. It's that any time a religion, I'm sorry, any time a religious employer wants to hire and fire or take other employment action for religious reasons, the statutes themselves let them do that. Uh, and, if they, and if for some reason even then the statute doesn't give them what they want, they can raise the free exercise clause. So the only place the ministerial exception really matters is in a case where the religion is not acting for religious reasons. Uh, and so that's this case. Uh, I think this is Ginsburg, as you have said, with Ms. Veal and her cancer treatments and with Morrissey Baru being fired simply because she alleges she got too old, uh, is that those are the cases where the ministerial exception matters. And maybe this is the way I would say, stripped of all the labels, I think, which can make the case sound more complicated than it is, I think the best way to think about this case is to say, when does a church require, or sorry, I should say a religious employer require absolute categorical immunity to hire and fire people for whatever reason they want, whether it be uh, race discrimination, uh, whether it be uh, any, uh, any other uh, uh, thing that doesn't have anything to do with their religion. And when, on the other hand, is it enough with respect to an employee to say, of course you have an important stake in how they perform their religious functions and duties, uh, and if you have a problem with that, you're allowed to fire them or discipline them or anything else, but you, can't, you just simply can't do it uh, for non-religious reasons. And our submission here, just to, just to finish that thought, is we think when it comes to lay teachers, the 300,000 lay teachers in Catholic schools and other religious schools across the country, not to mention the one or 200,000 more uh, uh, teachers in religious universities and colleges, that we think when you talk about those people, it is enough to serve the religion's legitimate interests to say, uh, if you have a problem with how they're teaching religion or how they're otherwise upholding them themselves in light of your faith, you can hire or fire them. But you can't uh, say, we don't care when you come in, whether you're of our religion, and we don't care when we fired you about anything to do with religion, but we still get immunity. We think that's a bridge too far. Thank you. Justice Breyer? You said, uh, counsel, thank you very much. Uh, you, you said that 
uh, what we're looking for is where is it court should really stay out in respect to a religion that we will not even look if this defendant <coughs> committed a violation of a statute that has nothing to do with religion. Justice Ginsburg went on about that. All right, that's what the case does hold, uh, Tabor. But who are those people? And we called them ministers. But they were people in positions of leadership or authority. But we know some religions, everyone has that kind of position. Other religions, no. Uh, some religions think people without education are the ones to be the ministers. Others might think vast education. All right, given that circumstance and the desire not to have us meddle too much and to keep the, the uh, uh, religion independent, what advice can you give us? What should we write in these paragraphs? I can, you know, we could start by saying leadership or authority, but what else can we write that will, uh, or what, what should we write to say guide the lower courts so they don't meddle too much? Well, Justice Breyer, let me answer that in first in terms of theory and second in terms of uh, the experience in the courts uh, for the past several decades. Uh, in terms of theory, I think you're absolutely right to be concerned about entanglement, and that's why we say the first thing you should write is the same thing you wrote at the beginning of Hosanna Tabor, which is that to the extent that ministerial status can be gleaned from objective factors, that's where courts ought to look. They ought to look to the ex ante designations that uh, religions themselves make. Uh, uh, when, that, when that isn't uh, a conclusive answer. Yes, we can look at functions, uh, but we have to be very careful when we do, and that ought not drive the analysis. The other side's test, I don't think I, even in the entire first half of the argument I have ever, ever heard a meaningful definition of what an re important religious function is. And if that were the sole test, uh, I, I, I respectfully submit you're going to have just impossible entanglement problems. Even they can see the janitor, uh, may, maybe the administrator, although that has been argued by other religious institutions in the past, but they seem to concede it. So there's going to have to be a line drawn in the way is what's the best path forward. And so let me then tell you in terms of practical terms what I think is important, uh, which is before Hosanna Tabor, as the court and the concurrence in, uh, by Justice Alito stressed, there had been several decades of the ministerial exception in the lower courts. The position we're advocating today is consistent with the overwhelming weight of that authority. So I can not only give you my theory today, but I can lend you the practical assurance that for several decades in the lower courts, uh, and this all, these are all gathered in footnote one of our red brief, uh, the courts consistently held that lay teachers in religious schools, even if they taught some religion, were outside of the ministerial exception. And so that line was durable and workable, and indeed the federal government brought many of those cases and established that rule and had that rule across several administrations for many decades. So it's a little bit like the Maui case, Justice Breyer, where you have hard lines to draw, but you can take some comfort with decades of experience in the lower courts and the government's own position uh, that prevailed until the moment of this case right now. Uh, so I think that actually should help bolster uh, my position just in practical terms, because if you write an opinion that says, all important religious functions uh, trigger the ministerial exception. I don't think there's just any way to escape. You're going to have the cases with the nurses. You're going to have the cases with the football coaches. Uh, you're going to have the cases uh, with the com summer counselors. The only thing the other side says to that in our brief is, well, uh, those cases haven't been brought so much. But my answer to that is, that just shows how revolutionary their case would be, because there's no good answer to those cases. And Mr. Rothbard himself said this morning that nurses would be covered. Uh, we've found several cases recently where nurses brought employment discrimination cases. They weren't even, uh, the Renaissance exception wasn't even raised in those cases. Uh, so now you're talking about hundreds of thousands of nurses being stripped of their employment law protections. And this is the last thing I'd say in terms of practical consequences. Remember that we're not just talking about employment discrimination laws here. I know Hosanna Tabor uh, tailored the opinion that way, as Ms. Ratner properly said, but the lower courts have said that the ministerial exception applies to the Fair Labor uh, Standards Act, as has the federal government, uh, Equal Pay Act, uh, many other statutes, and also just ordinary state law credentialing. Uh, many states uh, many states have laws that say teachers have to have a certain amount of education or training uh, or that they have to have certain criminal background checks or, uh, or the like. 
I don't see how you can uphold the constitutionality of any of those laws or requirements under the other type of test, which the theory is that for all lay teachers in Catholic schools or other religious schools who are teaching religion, the government can have nothing to do with what reasons those people are hired or fired for or what their qualifications might be. Justice Alito? This issue can come up in many, many, many different contexts as the questioning this morning has brought out. But what is before us is a very specific case, or rather two very specific similar cases, and it has to do with teachers in a religiously affiliated elementary school. Uh, so suppose these teachers taught in a secondary school, and they taught exactly one subject, and that is religion. Students came for 50 minutes a day, and they had a religious class, and it was taught by these teachers. Would they qualify? Uh, Justice Alito, is your assumption in that hypothetical that, they, that those teachers have no other indicia of ministerial status, uh, that they don't have any special training or title or the like? Well, they have, they have the training that the school thinks is sufficient, and they are not labeled minister. And do you appreciate that the very term minister it, it treats different religions differently? It is a predominantly Christian Protestant term. And as you apply it to other religions, it becomes its application becomes less and less clear. So they do one thing, they teach religion, and they have the title of teacher of religion in a Catholic school. Do they qualify? Oh, Justice Alito, I think it's an, the reason I ask, and I apologize, is that I think it's going to be an uncommon situation where that person is going to have no other formal indicia of ministerial status. But if you have that sort of a case, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you have that sort of a case, we think that person would probably not be a minister still. Uh, but you don't have to decide that here. Obviously, well, why would that person not be a minister? The person wouldn't be a minister in that case because. Uh, I think at least arguably, uh, because even then the person would not be assuming a, person, a, place, a position of spiritual leadership of the congregation. And we think that's what the core of the ministerial exception is about. And Justice Alito, maybe it helps well, I think you. That's the core of the, uh, I, I would be more comfortable if we jettisoned the whole term ministerial exception, because I do think it's discriminatory. But why is there less of a religious autonomy issue, and why is there not a very central religious autonomy issue there? The, the uh, function of teaching a religion to new generations is central. Yeah, Justice Alito, I don't deny that for one minute, and I think that is why the schools have every, every ability to make free exercise arguments because of the absolute centrality of that function. But remember, and I'm happy to jettison the ministerial exception label. What we're really talking about here is when are the schools or when are religious employers immune? When, are they, when, do, they, when do they need absolute, what some courts call ecclesiastical immunity? And to get there, you need not just free exercise concerns in play, but you need establishment clause concerns in play. And I think, Justice Alito, with all fairness, you've identified what I would think of as the edge case, which is a case where somebody teaches religion uh, full time. Uh, as their job, but doesn't have any other ministerial uh, well, considerations in place. What is the fundamental difference between that situation and the situation of an elementary school teacher who teaches everything, including religion, and for a school that is set up by a religious body, the teaching of religion is central. That is why that's the very reason why these schools are set up. Otherwise, there would be no reason. The, the students could go to the to the public school and not have to pay any tuition. So it's central to their mission, and the fact that it is done by in an elementary school by one teacher who teaches everything, including religion, uh, why should that make a difference, whether it's structured that way or it's structured as it might be in a secondary school? I think the difference, Justice Alito, is when somebody teaches only religion and nothing else, their stature is as more of an expert on the faith and a preacher of the faith. When you have somebody who's a general curriculum teacher and who just happens to pick up the workbook for 40 minutes a day and teach religion during that segment of the day, that person isn't seen, I don't think, as, as holding the same degree of position in 
in the church hierarchy in, term, in terms of church leadership. And remember, Justice Alito, I don't think there's any possible way to distinguish the general curriculum teacher who teaches religion 40 minutes a day from the science teacher, the history teacher, the English teacher, who probably, once you tally up the number of minutes in that day where religion comes into play, is teaching at least 40 minutes worth of religion, if not anything more. So just in terms of consequences, Justice Alito, you take a step from a very small group of teachers in schools to hundreds of thousands of teachers in K through 12 across the country, well, we maybe may hundreds not, of thousands more. You may or may not take a step, but that, that, those other teachers are not an issue here. What is an issue here is exactly is an elementary school teacher who teaches religion as well as other things. Well, Justice Plato, just in terms of numbers, I think even there you have, uh, I think, about 150,000 teachers uh, in front of you in this case that as, as the lower court case law developed for Hosanna Tabor were never considered to be ministers. Uh, and I don't, as I said, just with all due respect, I don't think there's any meaningful way to distinguish, as the Catholic Bishops' Brief says, as the American Jewish Committee Brief says, as the Catholic Colleges' Brief says, all these briefs are on the other side of the case of mine from me. They all stress there's no way to distinguish somebody who teaches a secular subject with religion and views from somebody who teaches uh, as my clients did in this case. Justice Sotomayor? Mr. Fisher, um, I understand the government supported Mrs. Beale just two years ago in the Ninth Circuit and Correct. argued that merely teaching two hours per week um, spent teaching religion, that that didn't qualify her as a minister. Um, it's now said something, Ms. Ratner said something that has taken me by surprise, which is she seems to be saying that the Ninth Circuit got this particular case wrong. Um, because they were using labels as talismanic. Did you understand that argument by her? And if you did, why is she wrong? Uh, well, I, I think just in terms of what the Ninth Circuit did, uh, the court was, it, was, was clear to say that we're not simply resting this on the absence of the label minister, but we're looking at all the factors in Hosanna Tabor itself and saying that overall in totality of the circumstances, uh, they're not enough here. Uh, the Ninth Circuit also said in its opinion that no other court had deemed teachers like these to be ministers ever before uh, that had so little religious leadership as part of their, uh, their duties. And they were, the Ninth Circuit was right about that. Uh, they were right even after Hosanna Tabor. There's only one case that's close, which is out of the Seventh Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit distinguished that case. But more generally, as I said, the Ninth Circuit outcome here was not just what the government asked for. It's what the government itself asked for for decades, going all the way back to uh, the President Reagan's administration, uh, is that lay teachers who teach some religion are on one side of the scale, uh, and other people who are core spiritual leaders uh, in seminary schools and the like uh, are, on the other hand, are on the other side of the scale. Uh, so it really is a sea change, even as to teachers, leaving everything else aside, it is truly a sea change that is being requested by the other side here today in terms of how teachers and schools are classified and whether they have any employment rights at all, uh, or, in, or in fact whether, uh, uh, at least if you follow the way the lower courts have, have implemented the ministerial exception, you basically have employment law free zones in all religious schools. The Fourth Circuit in Rayburn used the primarily religious function test. Um, you haven't adopted that or even spoke about it in your brief. Can you tell me what you think the strengths or limits of that test might be? Just as Sotomayor, we think that Hosanna Tabor is consistent with Rayburn and, indeed, and also consistent with our test. What Rayburn did is it dealt with a case where uh, a person applied for a a position called a, pa a pastoral care position, and even though the woman in that case who applied for the position didn't have a ministerial title, what Judge Wilkinson said is because of uh, the way this church is structured, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, doesn't give women uh, ordained titles, that cannot be determinative. And we agree with that. We say that function should be a cross-check, function should be part of the analysis to make sure that you're not disadvantaging minority religions or otherwise uh, being too formalistic in the analysis. So we agree with what Judge Wilkinson said. I think what, what might be the disconnect between what you're hearing from the different parties in this case is it's true that the other side can 
pull quotes out of Rayborn and pull quotes out of cases both before and after Hosanna Tabor that say function should be what controls. But I think what you'd find if you look at all those cases is those are all cases where there really truly was an exceptional circumstances at play where uh, there were special reasons like in Rayburn why the, the more objective factors didn't provide the right answer. And again, we agree that then function does, uh, uh, does have an enhanced role in that circumstance. Uh, but another way to uh, answer the question to Sotomayor is to say, remember, we're asking for what lower courts have done on the ground. Just make it concrete and say, what were lay teachers' status for the decades up to and even after Hosanna Tabor? And the status was non-ministers. And there's no way to reconcile those holdings, those concrete holdings, with the other side's view that, first of all, the controlling inquiry is whether somebody performs any important religious functions. And secondly, what the government and now petitioners themselves say, which is you defer to the uh, re religious employers themselves as to that question. Uh, if that were the real test, you would have millions of people falling within the ministerial exception. Uh, and I don't see how you can make any sense of what the lower courts had done for decades uh, if that were the test. Thank you. Justice Kagan? Mr. Fisher, I'd like to take you back to Justice Alito's questions because uh, some of what you said surprised me. Um, uh, with respect to a teacher who is a full-time teacher of religion, teaching religious doctrine, teaching religious practice, teaching religious texts, any of those things, I would have thought that Hosanna uh, Tabor, even though it has the thing about commissioning and title and so forth, um, it, you know, thinks of those people whose job it is to teach religion and to uh, uh, basically bring up the next generation in important understandings of religious doctrine and practice, that those people would be covered. But you said no. And I, I, so I want to just sort of say why. Justice Kagan, I think what I said uh, is I think that's the hardest case. For me, that's the edge case. Uh, uh, and I can make arguments both ways that I really wouldn't have to win here. I think what I really want to do is persuade you that those people are different from the lay teachers uh, that I represent here. Uh, but just to answer your question directly, uh, I do think that somebody who did only that function and had no other training, title, uh, or, or even had to be of the same faith to perform that job, I think that that person, you could still question whether that person is central to the establishment of religion. Remember, I think there would be very strong free exercise interests in play there, but that particular person I don't think is involved in establishing the church. But as I said, Justice Kagan, I, I, I freely admit you can disagree with me on that and draw the line between people who teach religion full time and people who are otherwise uh, lay teachers teaching a general curriculum or teaching a secular subject with religion infused. Well, where do we draw that line then? I mean, suppose that I think that the full-time religion teacher is, uh, is protected uh, by this exemption. Uh, then I think Justice Alito raises a fair point here. It's like, well, in an elementary school, maybe you have to teach some other subjects too. So maybe it's a half-time religious teacher, or maybe it's a quarter-time. I mean, where do we draw that line? I think that line holds up pretty well, Justice Kagan, um, uh, just, just in terms of uh, – just the basic idea that somebody teaching religion all day is going to be different than somebody teaching it uh, just for a small part of the day as part of a general curriculum. And maybe this is a way to think about it, Justice Kagan. The, even if you strip away all the other objective factors, the school is going to hire somebody uh, under slightly different criteria and with a different idea in mind to be the religion teacher in a school compared to somebody who's going to be the general curriculum teacher. Uh, so, yes, religion in a Catholic school or other religious school may be particularly important, uh, but just like uh, science and math and all the other subjects, uh, the, the school isn't necessarily going to think that this person needs to be a leader and an expert in that field to hold the position. And, and, and what of the uh, question of whether the person is a member of the faith? Um, and, you know, as I suggested to Ms. Ratner, I was surprised by the emphasis that they put on that. But on the other hand, I suppose I can think of um, there, there, uh, you know, a, a, a yeshiva says that there's a, a non-Jewish um, uh, great Talmud scholar and, and, and hires that person. Why shouldn't that person count? Justice Kagan, we do not think 
the, uh, the co-religionism is an on-off switch. We just think it's a very, very strong objective factor uh, in our column in this case, and it ought to be uh, an important objective factor. The way Hosanna Tabor put it, and I think the way you put it earlier in the argument, was whether per somebody was not just a member of the faith, but a special person within the membership of the faith who, who is, has a stewardship over that congregation or that religion. And it's just a very, very odd thing to say that somebody uh, who is not even a member of the faith and may fervently believe in a different faith uh, is somehow a minister of that religion. And Justice Kagan, I think that hypothetical is what really does a good job of prying apart the two different strands of constitutional law uh, in the First Amendment that are relevant here. Absolutely, when a school hires a teacher to say, teach religion to our students and even do it devotionally if you can, uh, that is something on which the school has very, very strong free exercise interest in. Uh, and so they can immediately fire that person if they're not pleased with the way the person is teaching their religion or anything else. Uh, but we just don't think that's an establishment clause question. It's a very odd thing to say the, that the government is establishing religion by saying, uh, uh, to a school uh, for positions where you don't even care whether the person is of your religion and you've hired and fired them for reasons that have nothing to do with your religion. You're entitled to categorical, categorical immunity for those decisions because of the First Amendment. That just seems like uh, an odd conclusion and I think tells you there's something wrong with the analysis on the other side. Thank you. Justice Gorsuch? Council, so we've gone from the full-time religion teacher to the part-time religion teacher, and the line that I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with that you're drawing there is uh, the part-time teacher is less important, but what if the school can't afford one, um, a full-time teacher? Maybe they can only afford a part-time teacher. Um, you, you mentioned that you thought it important that they be part of the faith, but then you withdrew from that a bit, recognizing that one could be a, a, a part of another faith and also minister in this faith, Protestants, Catholics, different reform, conservative Jews, whatever. Um, so wh where I'm, I'm struggling with where you draw the line and, and, and how much entanglement you're, you're going to get us, both sides are going to get us in uh, here in deciding what's an important enough person in, in a particular faith and how we avoid that, that difficulty. Uh, so just as Gorsuch, let me talk first about the part-time hypothetical and then the importance and entanglement. On the part-time question, I, I, I may not fully understand your hypothetical, but I, but, I, but I think that if a school said we're limited funds, uh, we want teaching religion in our school is very important to us, but we don't have the funds to hire a full-time religion teacher, uh, we're just going to hire a part-time teacher, I think that whatever answer you would give to the full-time religion teacher who taught only a religion would also apply to the part-time okay, teacher. Okay, let me change the hypothetical then. Um, what, if, what if the members of, of the congregation believe that all persons are ministers of the faith, bishops maybe even, and that they are all equally capable of teaching religion, and, and that's something they all wish to do part-time while also teaching other subjects? Well, Justice Gorsuch, I think that Hosanna Tabor itself, you know, if you're talking about that in terms of a labeling exercise, Hosanna Tabor itself said that it, uh, that that would not be enough. And I think that just again highlights the real issue in front of the court is not whom the religion considers to be its ministers uh, or even whom the religion considers to be performing its most important religious functions. It's who among uh, employees of religious employers uh, are performing such a uh, such vital duties to the establishment of the church that any qualification requirements or any legal enforcement having to do with their rights or, or qualifications would necessarily run afoul of the establishment clause. And I think if we just get away from labels, I wholeheartedly agree there are enormous uh, entanglement questions in asking what is important uh, or, or, or who, even who, who religions consider to be their minister. I think the very problem with the other side's test and, if, and you just read the materials that we've cited and they will tell you, is, it is very clear that, the other, that, that religious employers sincerely and deeply believe that all of their nurses, all of their teachers, even all of their administrators and janitors are performing important religious functions in terms of the uh, religious mission of that church. And so that can't be the question. And so I think the question is the legal question arising from the First Amendment as to who is involved with the establishment of the church. That's the only way you can get to immunity. 
And so I think perhaps perhaps just that first principles approach or even that textual approach uh, kind of helps shed some light on the situation and keep courts a little more on the law side of the line. Mr. Fisher, did you, did you, did you said that we, 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 we can't, we, can't uh, uh, we shouldn't focus on, on their sincerely held religious beliefs, but that is what we do elsewhere in, in First Amendment jurisprudence. We don't second guess those sincerely held religious beliefs. Why, why would we do it here and second guess who they deem a minister? No, that's my point, Justice Gorsuch. I don't think you should second guess what well, – well, let me be clear here. I don't think you should second guess what religious institutions define as their own religious beliefs or values. I don't think you should second guess whether they sincerely believe that employees perform important religious functions. Uh, but that just shows that that can't possibly be the right test here. And I think your earlier questions pointed that out. And so you're exactly right. The courts should stay out of that business. And so what's the solution then? Well, we think what the solution is is that these courts should look to the objective factors uh, that are outlined in Hosanna Tabor, the things that are more legalistic and the things that are more ex-ante decisions of the church as to who to designate as its spiritual leaders. And then ask that legal question about, uh, about function and duties through the lens of the Establishment Clause as a matter of first principles. We think it's telling Justice Gorsuch that for uh, centuries of history that is discussed on the other side of this case, there's not one single example of a person who was not a titled member of the clergy receiving the kind of protection they're being requested today. We think if there was this deeply rooted First Amendment rule that they're describing, uh, there would be in thousands of cases, millions of cases, because they're talking about expanding who is covered by the ministerial exception from primarily people that have objective indicia of ministerial status to making them truly the minority among a sea of employees, just, just teachers alone, uh, who have uh, important religious duties but have never been thought to fall within the ministerial exception. Thank you. Justice Kavanaugh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and good afternoon, and welcome, Mr. Fisher. Uh, I want to start with a question that comes from the uh, amicus brief of the Milwaukee Jewish Day School. They say that the Ninth Circuit's approach, the more formalistic or objective approach, uh, means that, in their words, quote, Jewish schools have fared markedly worse, uh, end quote, under that test, under the Ninth Circuit's uh, formulation, at least, of that test. I want to get your reaction to that and how we can prevent that. Well, Justice Kavanaugh, I haven't seen any empirical uh, proof for that statement, and we don't see why that would be the case. Remember, uh, the Ninth Circuit itself harmonized its decision with the Seventh Circuit's Gruscott case, which dealt with the Jewish day school, and said that even there the teacher had a special training to be teaching uh, in that school, and that teacher may well be different. And, and, and Justice Kavanaugh, if I would just return to you, I know, I know I've said this before, but the cases we cite in Red Brief and our red brief in footnote one deal with uh, schools of the Christian faith, of Jewish faith, and I think some, even some other faiths. And across the board, uh, we see a consistent treatment of lay teachers like our clients here being outside of the ministerial exception. Uh, okay. So what, next, next question is, uh, in terms of formulating the legal test, as the court said in Hosanna Tabor, it's uh, enough in the first case just to list the factors. Uh, we may have to refine that in this case. If we refined it by adopting Justice Alito's concurrence, what would be the problems, if any, with that from your perspective? Well, I, I think the, uh, we agree with much of the concurrence, Justice Kavanaugh. We agree that titles, certainly the, certainly the moniker minister, but the titles more generally should be determinative. And we, and we agree that function is important. And we further agree, as I was just saying, that uh, what the court ought to do, uh, particularly if it wants to be careful in this highly sensitive area, is follow uh, the vast experience of the lower courts. Now, where I depart from the concurrence, and I, and I, and I just, this is just my own uh, difficulty understanding it, is that concurrence leaves out all of the cases that we cite in footnote one of our, of our brief. Uh, so the concurrence on the one hand says weird things to be consistent with past law, but then suggests, I think you're right, Justice Kavanaugh had some suggestions that perhaps um, uh, perhaps a broader ministerial exception for teachers would be appropriate. And I okay. think the way that we would tell the court, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to get another uh, question or two in. Uh, you mentioned earlier a religious teacher who just picks up, religion teacher who just picks up the handbook, uh, 
and uh, you referred to someone like that having no training. And I'm, I guess I would question the training point. Uh, there's no way to do this empirically, but my guess is a lot of religion teachers would say their life is their training. How would you respond to that? Well, I, I, think, I think I'd respond to that by returning to one of Mr. Rossbach's own answers when he was asked, is it enough to be a model or a witness? Uh, I think he said no. Uh, and so I think there's something more than being a model of the faith or using your own personal experience, because I don't see how you would distinguish the teachers in this case, if that were the, uh, a proper touchstone, from the hundreds of thousands or millions of other uh, employees of religious institutions who are told in their handbooks, in their contracts, by their supervisors uh, to carry out themselves during work hours and in their lives according to the faith. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. You have a minute or so to wrap up if you'd like. Uh, thank you. Did I hear somebody else wanted to ask a question? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, with no other questions, I'll just simply return the court to what I think is important to bear in mind is the overall uh, question in this case, which is when is categorical immunity required on the one hand, and when is it not enough to say you, you're entitled to a statutory matter to choose people of your own religion to work for you, and you're also entitled to a statutory matter and as a free exercise matter uh, to hire and fire and set their terms and conditions of employment according to your religious values. Uh, and we think the lay teachers here fall on the latter side of the line. Uh, it is enough to give the schools, in this case, the ability to hire, fire, discipline, and otherwise set the terms and conditions of employment according to their religious values. And it is too much, and it would blow a hole in our nation's civil rights laws and our employment laws in general to say that categorical immunity applies, and so schools can pay people different amounts, uh, uh, use race, sex, other prohibited characteristics, even when they have nothing to do uh, with the religion and the religious values at stake. Uh, so we ask the court to affirm. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. Rasbeck, uh, two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may I please the court. Uh, the, a few points. The first is that the proof is in the pudding, and we have the pudding here. The ministerial exception has been working well for decades and has been using the functional consensus both before and after Hosanna Tabor. Uh, and you look at our pages eight through nine of the yellow brief, we explain that there are other uh, cases where lay teachers and, and have been decided under, under the functional test. So there, I would advert to the uh, fact that the, the federal government said there are three buckets, pastors, musicians, teachers. The teacher cases are common and they get decided under the functional consensus all the time. And I would say post Hosanna Tabor, there's been a real crystallization among the lower courts around the Alito concurrence in Hosanna Tabor. By contrast, the respondent's test has never been used. And their claims of things like you know, nurse, lots and lots of nurse cases, there haven't been nurse cases in four decades. There's not going to start being a lot now. Um, there's no need to decide the co-religionist issue in this case. In this case, they, they, are, they were co-religionists, and both schools wanted their teachers to be Catholic, just like in uh, Hosanna Tabor, when there were non, uh, not people from that same religion, they were used, there were sometimes gap fillers employed. Uh, and finally, this is a heartland case. These teachers are the primary teachers of the faith. They are the stewards of the faith. They are the leaders of their classroom. They, they the function of teaching the next generation is central, as Mr. Fisher just conceded. These, these are the people who will teach the faith to the next generation. If, if they don't do it, no one else will. The decisions below would replace with the indicator's well-designed framework for deciding delicate church-state questions with the constitutional thicket. They should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. The Honorable Court is now adjourned until tomorrow at 10 o'clock. <laughs>